A few years back, my friends and I were at our church late at night playing D&D. Our friend Brenton was the son of the pastor. His name was Robin, and he was not only our pastor, but a licensed exorcist as well. It was five of us kids there. Brenton, Scott, Zach, Quashan, me, and also Brenton's dad was in the building. My mom showed up later after D&D, making for a total of seven people in the church. So us kids were tasked with turning the lights off all throughout the building. We ran around getting it done and decided to meet up in the chapel upstairs. That chapel is tiny, with only four pews on each side meant for younger kids. When the last light for the chapel where we had met up in was turned off, the atmosphere did a complete 180. Things felt different to me at least, but to my friends not so much. They laughed, joked, and focused on scaring my mom. We sat in the chapel room for a bit waiting, asking the typical, if anyone is here, please reveal yourselves requests. Of course, there was nothing. It made me a little upset, as my mom and I love the paranormal, and to not get anything right off the bat was disappointing. Robin, Brenton's dad, suggested that we go next door to the nursery's kid playroom. We agreed and made the 10 second trek. My mom didn't like it. She had been taking photos before with the flash on, hoping to catch something, but was refusing to do so at that point. She said she was afraid of seeing something. When we asked for a sign from anyone who might be present, the smell of vanilla perfume filled the room. You're probably thinking that it was just my mom's perfume, and I don't blame you, but no. She can't use perfume, as she gets sick when she smells it. I asked Robin what it could be, and he told me that back in the 50s, there had been an employee who worked in the nursery. She had worn vanilla perfume to work every day, and older people who had known her could confirm that. We decided to walk down to the main chapel, which was huge, by the way. We sat in the middle row of the first two pews. Kids sat in the second, the two adults in the first. All of us kids started feeling sick like we were about to puke. Brenton's dad noticed this and suggested that we go to the basement for one last try and that after that we should call it a night. We all thought, why not, and decided to go. We sat in the basement on the couch facing toward the wall, which was a good distance away since the whole basement was actually a dining hall with a kitchen next to it. Next to me on the couch was my mom, Zach, Quishon, and Robin. Brenton was actually still sick and laid out on the sofa chair in front of us while Scott laid on the floor playing with his phone. Quishon started snapping photos non-stop. I swear he took over a hundred in the basement alone. With every photo taken, there was a red haze that seemed to grow brighter and brighter. Then we heard clicking. It sounded like a light switch coming from the storage room. We were all like, I'm not checking that out, since Scott. He shrugged and went to go check. Sometimes I think he wants to die, but really he just doesn't care about anything remotely scary. He walked up and discovered that the storage room light was turning on and off by itself. He called back to tell us that he thought someone might be in the room. Robin stood up and told him to open the door. Scott did as he was directed and sure enough, the light was on, but no one was in there. Scott closed the door and walked back, laid on the ground and got back on his phone like nothing strange was going on. Kushan was back at it again snapping photos until one of the images made him pause entirely and say, Uh, hey Robin, can you look at this? Robin grabbed the phone, chuckled, and said, Yup, that's something alright. My mom asked to see it as well and then emitted the loudest scream ever before running behind the couch. I asked to look at it, telling her that she had to be overreacting. She yelled at me and for the first time in my life told me to shut up. I looked at the photograph, and right in the middle of the basement, clear as day, was a person standing there. He was old and bald, with a Catholic robe on and a red sash, arms by his side. I couldn't make out anything below his knees. I saw facial features and everything else, though. I looked up, terrified, fear of what I saw rushing through my body. I screamed, jumped up, and ran toward the corner. Robin rushed and turned the lights on, making my mom feel safer. We called it quits and went upstairs. We found old photos of the priest in the church's photo albums. 
Robin asked me to point out the man that I had seen, and I did. It was the exact man from the basement photo, but instead a much older photo of him when he had been alive. Robin agreed that he did indeed look the same, and so did Quishan, along with my mom. We packed up the D&D game, put everything into the car, and we all drove home. Sadly, we tried to recover the photos and transfer them to a computer, but all of the files showed up as being corrupted. After this experience, nothing else has happened, at least aside from one instance. Our friend's dad was leaving the church, so we did one last game night with no ghost hunt, where we played D&D for six hours straight. This was only a year ago. We were packing up the car. Everyone was outside talking. I walked to the front of the church, just reminiscing about all the good times that we had there, and how it felt like a chapter of our childhood was coming to an end. That's when I saw a black figure in the bell tower. I stared at it and knew that it was staring back at me. I looked at it one last time and walked back to the car without telling anyone. We missed that church every day. I stopped going after Robin left. One day I was sent to clean up the nursery with no help. The whole time I was in there alone, I felt as though I were being watched and didn't feel safe. I ran out for the last time when I heard a little kid giggling in the playroom. This is my mom and dad's story. It was their honeymoon. They married in August of 1980 in Australia and they were driving along the Bruce Highway into a city called Rockhampton, Queensland. It was late at night, 8 p.m.-ish, and they had been driving most of the day. There is a very long stretch of road before you come into the city that's just bush, kilometers of it. At night, the bush can be very scary. They had not passed cars for some time, probably a couple of hours. Out of nowhere, headlights appeared a long way behind them in their rearview mirror. That was fine, whatever. They keep driving as normal. Then, the headlights start getting closer and closer. My dad is driving and says something like, what a bloody turkey, look at how fast he's going. The car comes right up to them with their high beams on and follows them for about five minutes like that. Mom and dad have a conversation about why can't the person just overtake them. Then, the car completely backs off like slows right down almost to a complete stop and hangs back about one to two kilometers away for a good 15 minutes. Mom and dad both think that that is super weird and creepy, but again, whatever, they just keep going. Then the car speeds up again, tailgating high beam and sort of swerving into the other lane as if to get to overtake them, but he never did. This goes on for another five-ish minutes. Mom and dad are both really scared now. Remember, this is the days before mobiles or cell phones, and besides, there would have been no reception in that area to call for help, even if they had them, and it's not over yet. The car backs off again, but not as far as before, and then hangs back there for about a minute, before hitting the gas and absolutely flying past mom and dad and finally passing them. There appeared to be only one person in the car, but they couldn't really see what that person looked like. There was also no number plate on the car to identify it. And I know my dad has told me heaps of times before, but I can't actually remember what sort of car it was now. I feel like it was sort of a sedan type of thing. Definitely white. The car disappears up the road, as if it were never there. Mom and dad were shaken to their core, but pleased that it was seemingly over. But no, it's still not done yet. The road now becomes a bit more windy, whereas previously it had almost been straight. Mom and Dad come around a corner and the car is parked in the middle of the road, facing them, again with high beams on, both driver and passenger doors wide open and the man, they can now see that it was a man, standing in front of the car with his arms spread wide, spread as if to make them stop. Mom was screaming at Dad, just hit him, don't stop, just hit him, and my dad being the bloody hero that he is, did not stop and drove around the man's car on the right-hand side of it, which would be the passenger side as it was parked facing them. 
The man tried to get in front of Dad, I assumed to stop him from driving off, as he made this maneuver, but he couldn't quite get there in time. He was very close to the car, and Dad nearly hit him. Dad absolutely floored it. He said he was doing around 130, 140 kilometers per hour to get away from that man. They aren't sure how long they drove like that, but they didn't slow back down to the speed limit until they started to come into the city limits. They made it to their hotel and parked the car at the back of the hotel so that you couldn't see it from the road because it was on the side of the highway and passing traffic could see the cars parked there. Mom was quite hysterical and told reception what had happened. They called the police and reported it, but they never found the car or the driver. Fast forward to many years later and Mom was watching the news and Ivan Milat had just been arrested. Mom screamed and called Dad into the lounge room. They both agreed that he was, in fact, the man that they saw. They were absolutely adamant. I can't find evidence to suggest that Ivan Milat was active in Queensland during that time, but I certainly won't call Mom and Dad liars because of what they saw. I imagine it was another creepy hillbilly who looked very similar to Mr. Backpacker Murderer. My dad was a pastor at a church for four years. Many people had died in this church before we got there. Over the course of these four years, some of the craziest, inexplicable stuff happened. I'm here to tell you a few of the best stories. My parents went to Maine every year. I had gotten tired of the trip and decided to stay home. I went over to the church to grab some snacks from the back of the old sanctuary. There were two sanctuaries. One was about 90 years old, and the newer one was about 50 years old. Anyways, I went to the back where the snack booth was. Mind you, this was the middle of the day, so it was completely lit up through the stained glass windows. So it was completely lit up through the stained glass windows. I bent down to grab some drinks from the mini fridge under the counter. When I stood back up and turned to walk out, I saw this figure standing in the doorway. It had no nose, mouth, eyes, or ears. It was just a bald head wearing a long, dark robe. The moment I laid eyes on it, it vanished. It's safe to say I ran out of there as fast as humanly possible. Another time, my cousin came over to spend the night at my house. We wanted to play PS4, but the other controller was over at the church. So we walked over there through my yard. It was pitch black out. When we opened the door, we might have made it two or three feet in before we heard the loudest, spine-tingling scream that I have ever heard coming from the back of the new sanctuary. We ran back outside and back into my house so fast. My cousin was on the verge of crying and kept saying that he was never going back into that church again. The church had a preschool in it. They would change out the toys in the classes every now and then so that the kids wouldn't get bored of them. One time the teacher took one of the kids upstairs to help her pick out some toys for the rest of the class. The old classrooms upstairs were used for storing said toys, extra chairs, and old desks at the time, so there was no one else up there except for the two of them. As the teacher was grabbing the toys, the kid that she had brought to help said, Hey, look at those kids playing with the toys over there. These are just a few of the experiences that people have had. I could sit and write out hundreds of paranormal experiences linked to that church, however, if I had the time. Disclaimer, I am completely aware that this story involves me being very stupid and careless. I'm not going to inject these acknowledgements into the story, but rest assured that in hindsight, I am aware of the foolishness that took place. Now, where to begin? The year was approximately 1998 or 1999. I was a young gay man in my early 20s, living in a medium-sized city in the Midwestern U.S. 
This was sort of an in-between transitional time for gay people, where in most populous areas we had enough respect to live openly, but there was still plenty of people who did not like us. It was well before the invention of smartphones, and the internet was still in the early stages of mass adoption. There were large communities online, but it was not yet at that point where most Americans were online. Online socialization consisted of chat rooms hosted by various services like AOL, Yahoo, or IRC servers, and message boards were still in use by large numbers of people. For gay men at the time, it was nothing short of revolutionary. Prior to the internet and to the broader cultural changes, gay men had been stuck looking for fun in secretive and or shady places due to the inability to freely express ourselves. In the 90s, it was still somewhat risky, but the internet offered a way to talk freely and relatively anonymously without the risk of being outed or worse. For this reason, it really took off in the gay communities, and gay men were a very large part of the user bases for these social platforms. It was suddenly very easy and relatively safe to find dates, friends, or just sex, and it quickly became the norm for a lot of gay men. On the other hand, being such a new tool for most people for communication, we were sometimes blind to the risks. Being an attractive young man in my prime, I made liberal use of the online communities to find dates. That is to say, I had plenty of hookups. My city had a decent number of chat rooms and personal message boards, and I had mostly great experiences. I met the typical assortment of good guys, closet cases, and the weirdos that you would expect. I was an absolute quote-unquote hoe by most standards, but suffice to say that a cute gay guy at that time could literally generally have a lot more dates than your typical straight person. At some point during this time, I had some brief chat on a message board with a guy from my city. I forgot his screen name, it's been over 20 years, so let's call him SlimGuy65. This back and forth had happened on a general thread in the gay section, not in private messages, so it was visible to anyone who chose to read that thread. Nothing had come of it, but a week later, I received an email from an unrecognized address. The email basically said, Hey, I'm not gay and I don't agree with the gay lifestyle. I'm here because my friend met this guy, SlimGuy65, from the message board and the guy really hurt him. I don't want to see this happen to anyone else. My friend tried to tell the police, but they wouldn't do anything. I see you're talking to Slim Guy 65, so just be careful and stay away from him. Okay, I thought. That's strange. What does this person mean by really hurt him? Was his heart broken? Did he get beaten up or verbally abused or what? I responded to the email, asking for clarification on what exactly had happened. I never received a response. I was slightly weirded out by it, but on the other hand, it's an anonymous email from someone who doesn't respond and is vague about their warning. This could be anything. It could be some disgruntled ex trying to mess with the guy. It could be a real warning about some gay bashing. It could be someone trolling who doesn't have anything to do with anyone. I kept it in the back of my mind, but pretty much shrugged it off. Several weeks later, I had a weekday off of work and decided to take to the internet, as was my custom. Lo and behold, I had an email response to a personal ad. It was SlimGuy65. He was offering to meet at his place to hang out and just have a good time. Wink wink, nudge nudge. I won't go into the details, as I recall there weren't really many details discussed other than small talk and intros that we had done previously. Nothing about this guy was really sounding interesting to me, but I had no other offers on this day, so I decided why not. I'll go see what this dude is about. As I typed my reply, I suddenly remembered the strange email that I had received warning me about this person. I went back and reread it. Still vague, still presenting more questions than answers. Should I take this anonymous warning at face value and just ignore SG65? I decided to go check him out anyway. His address was on a rather busy street in the middle of a dense residential area, not some shack out in the woods, and I can handle myself. If he's weird, I can just nope out of there. Before long, I arrived at the house at the agreed time. 
It was a duplex style home, with one apartment on the ground floor and one on the second floor, part of a row of several identical duplexes. It was the middle of the afternoon, there was plenty of traffic on the street, and the occasional person out on their porch or their backyard. I pulled up the driveway to the parking area behind the house, got out, and knocked on the door. The guy that answered was a pretty normal, kind of mousy looking man, probably in his 40s. Slight, slim build, soft spoken, looked like just about any guy working in any office cubicle anywhere. Not really my type, but honestly my curiosity was piqued, and I had nothing better to do so I stepped inside to take a look around and gauge the situation with the warning email fresh in my mind. I stepped into the back door, into the kitchen. It was very clean, and there was nothing out on the counters, no table, no chairs, nothing. That is to say, it did not look like someone was living there. It had been kept up and cleaned, but was empty. Looking out into the apartment, I could see that it was not set up as a living space. It had a large window with sliding glass that was between the kitchen and living room, and I could see what looked like a large table out in the living room area. SG-65 said something like, this isn't where I live. A friend of mine used to run a doctor's office here and I maintain the building for him. It's private though, we have the place to ourselves. Weird. Okay. He shut the back door and locked it. With a keypad deadbolt. The kind you need a key to open, even from the inside. And put his keys in his back pocket saying, so what do you want to do? At this point, my danger sense spiked. This is not a normal home, and why is he locking the door like that? It's not necessarily suspect, a lot of people have that sort of lock on their door, and the door has a window in it, so it makes sense, even. Still, something is not right here, I can tell, and now I'm locked in. I asked him why he was locking the door like that, which immediately flustered him. He was looking around rather nervously, and his voice was wavery and halting. Not quite stuttering, but almost. He said, um, well, we don't want someone to come in and interrupt us, right? Flashing a weak, unconvincing smile. His demeanor and body language were all I needed to confirm that this guy was up to no good. Or at least, that there was something he was hiding. However, I could tell that I was intimidating him. I wasn't a particularly muscular kid, but I have a larger frame. Like, even when I'm at my thinnest, I still wear size L tops and 36 waist pants, so I look big, which people tend to interpret as me being stronger than I really am. Also, I'm not a tough guy at all, but I have a resting facial expression that makes me look like a thug. People who don't know me often assume that I'm rough or something. I sometimes use this to my advantage while I can because before long a new acquaintance will eventually figure out that I'm a total wimp. But this was definitely an occasion to play up the tough guy appearance, and I did exactly that. I put on my best steely face and told him to unlock the door and that I don't want to be locked in here. He looked for a moment like he was going to pee his pants, then said, Okay, alright, I'll unlock this. He unlocked the deadbolt. And I'll just lock the knob here. And he turned the little dial that locks the doorknob. That was fine with me. I continued to stare at him until he said, I'll leave the keys on the counter right here. And he set his keys down near the sink. I was relatively satisfied with that answer. At this point, though, my adrenaline was flowing, and I was almost in full flight-or-fight mode. But I was stuck. Kind of stuck in place. The guy was between me and the door. I was freaked out, but this little weasel did not appear to pose any immediate physical threat to me. I could tell that his pant pockets were empty, and that I was intimidating the living hell out of him. I didn't yet know exactly what to do. Now keep in mind that despite my wordy descriptions, this all happened very quickly without any really long pauses. It had only been maybe one to two minutes since I had stepped in the door. This all happened at the pace of a conversation. The guy was obviously nervous and trying not to appear so. He said, well, let's go in, and walked a wide path around me through the kitchen into what would normally be the living room, and toward the hall to the right from there. I was familiar with his floor layout, it's very common in the area. 
The hallway would lead to two small bedrooms, with a bathroom in between them. I hesitated, thinking that I should just walk out that back door and take off. But really? Now I was super curious. I knew there's no way in hell I'm doing anything with this guy, but I kind of want to see what's going on in here. Also, I'm confident that he can't take me if it comes to a fight. So, I slowly headed toward the living room. It felt like I was walking in slow motion. From the kitchen entrance, I could see a large, rectangular, stainless steel table taking up a lot of the living space. I remember thinking this looks like a surgical table. It looked like it could rise and tilt, and it had a recessed channel running all the way around the edge. In hindsight, I now know what it was. It was 100% a mortician's table. Dude had a mortician's table in there. But at the time, I just thought it looked like some sort of medical table. There were some other office-type cabinets and stuff around, I think, but now all I really remember is the table itself. The large front window looking out onto the street was covered by vertical blinds that were closed. SG-65 said something like, This used to be a doctor's office, like I said. Come on back here. The hallway revealed the room setup that I had expected. The first bedroom door was closed. The second door was open to a very small, very clean bathroom. At the end of the hall was the other bedroom, which looked like, if the doctor's office story were true, had at one time been converted to an exam room. He said, we can go in that room if you want. Go ahead and take a look. And he stayed by the other closed bedroom door. The back bedroom door was open, and I could see the walls were covered in a honey-colored wood paneling. The type you might see in a den or office that hasn't been updated since the early 70s. I slowly took a few steps toward that door, trying to be very aware of what Mr. Creepy was doing behind me. He didn't move. When I got up to that room, the first thing I noticed was the door had a keypad deadbolt lock, just like the back door. This room locked from the outside. I wondered if there was a lever on the inside, but I pretty much know the answer to that question without needing to check. I also saw a chair. A non-swiveling, plastic desk chair with thin metal legs sitting near the center of the room. The room had old, dark carpet and those wood-paneled walls. I noticed that the walls were completely paneled with no windows. And I know that room had at least one window, probably two, so whoever did that paneling went over them on purpose. There was also a phone in there, plugged in and sitting on the floor. It was an old office phone, probably from around the 80s or early 90s. Dingy beige plastic with several buttons to manage different phone lines. He was just sitting there on the carpet near the wall, with the chair at a slight distance facing the phone. There was nothing else in that room. I was standing at the threshold of the room, with one foot slightly in, absolutely not going past that door frame. I looked back at Dude. He was still standing by the other door, just nervously smiling at me, trying very hard to look casual, but obviously very nervous or something. He said something like, well, what do you... what do you want to do? Instead of answering, I felt around the back side of the deadbolt lock. Sure enough, nothing there but the smooth wood of the door. It also dawned on me that I did not see a light switch anywhere for the ceiling lamp. Where was the switch? Who knows? It should have just been on the inside of the door, of course, but that original switch was covered by the paneling. He mumbled something about not having the key to that lock. Don't worry about it. I turned back to face the guy and just said, What is it that you want to do in here? My skin had gone ice cold as I realized that I was way, way, way too far into this apartment. I was running through my options in my head. What was this guy going to do? He didn't appear to have any weapon or anything in reach, but who the hell knows what goes on in that place? What are you trying to do? He was almost totally derailed by that. He stammered out some hot man-to-man -man fun with the weakest smile that I have ever seen, looking like he was just a hair's breadth away from panicking. That sounds comical, 
But really, that sentence was probably the most chilling part of the entire experience for me. It was the way he said it. Like he had to come up with something on the fly. Something that would sound plausible, and he failed. Who says that in real life? Hey, do you want to have some hot man-to-man -man fun? Nobody. It's something you'd see on an advertisement for a cheesy porn site or something. That was it. I said, nope. I want to go. I'm leaving. He said, uh, okay. I quickly walked past him as he flattened himself against the wall to avoid me and I noped right out through the living room dissection area and through the kitchen to the back door, which was thankfully still not deadbolted. The keys were still on the counter. I let myself out and didn't bother closing that as I saw him slowly coming to the door behind me. I deliberately walked, not ran, to my car. Looking back at the building, I could see that indeed there was a window facing the backyard area from that paneled room, but of course, it was covered up from the inside. Dude was shutting and locking the back door, and I left. Heart pounding, skin icy cold, thinking, holy crap, what was that? So, was this guy some sort of killer? Or was he just an awkward, closeted gay guy with access to a sterile-looking apartment with an autopsy-slash-mortuary table and a windowless room that locks from the outside with a chair and a phone and no light switch? It's clear to me that the poor soul who walks into that room gets locked in. He probably shuts off the light from somewhere and calls the phone. Other than that, it's anyone's guess as to what actually happens. I assume the friend of the judgmental person who emailed me must have been some kid that got locked in for whatever game ensues. Driving home, at first I thought, of course I have to call the police and tell them what's in that place. But thinking it through, I realized that I didn't really have any crime to tell them about. I went to meet a man for casual sex and what? He has a room with a chair in it. He has, as I thought at the time, an exam table. The police aren't going to do anything with that story. The guy didn't touch me or do anything to me, and I left. I considered calling an anonymous tip line, but again, what exactly would I report? There was no actionable crime. Also, keep in mind that at that time, while the local police in this city were pretty decent, they weren't especially interested in getting involved with helping out the gays. They would prosecute actual crimes if it was cut and dry, but I heard plenty of accounts of them not choosing to follow up on cases where there was not an easy arrest to be made. I decided not to report anything because nothing would come of it except drawing unwanted attention to myself. Even in retrospect, I think that that was probably the most rational choice to make. If this happened today in 2020, the law enforcement would probably be a lot more interested in it. But back then, not so much. So, live and learn. I still drove past that house once in a while during the normal course of life over the next several years, and I'd pay attention to how it looked. The vertical blinds were closed for maybe five or six years whenever I went past. Then, eventually, the blinds were down, and there were decorative curtains in the window, so I assumed that the place was eventually sold to someone who actually lived in it. Around 2002, maybe 2003, there was the murder of a young man on the news. He had been found in the next state, which borders on my city, so it's not very far away. I recognized the guy from the gay community, but didn't know him personally. A friend mentioned to me something about the local serial killer. I said, what? He explained that a few young men had gone missing over the past year, each after being at one specific dive bar and each being found several miles to the north past the state line and out in the country. The case on the news matched with that M.O. My friend told me that the young guy had been at that bar and left with someone that night and that he had disappeared. The news report didn't mention anything about a gay bar or similar recent cases, of course. I had to wonder if my acquaintance from the internet had anything to do with it. The location of the murders apparently was nowhere near that duplex, or at least according to the story I was told. 
I never heard of a resolution to that murder on the news, or any official mention of a suspected serial killer other than gossip. The house my grandparents owned when I was younger had a lady in the basement. At least, that's what I called her. My older sister called her the lady on the landing, because she only ever saw her on the landing to the basement. Either way, basement. I haven't correlated any of my personal stories with my cousins or siblings except my own. My aunt used to live down there, and I haven't dared to ask her about it because she had an experience when she was younger where she was physically lifted out of the bed by her ankles, and because of that, you can't even mention ghosts or paranormal stuff because she covers her ears and walks away. But that's another story for another day. Anyways, my personal stories. I'll try to keep them short and sweet. The first time I can recall seeing her, I was hanging out with my aunt, a different aunt than the one mentioned above. She and her son were in the house while my mom was working and my grandparents were in Hawaii. Now, for some reason, she chose to bathe me in the basement bathroom, which was weird because there was another fully functional bathroom with a bathtub on the second floor of the house as well as the shower in my grandparents' room. My cousin was expecting his friends to come over and play. The doorbell rang, so my aunt ran up to answer it, but had my cousin stay with me. I was about three or four at the time, he was about nine, just to keep an eye on me. She called him up to go play with his friends, and as soon as he left the bathroom and was halfway up the stairs, the door slammed shut and the lights turned off. Then, all of a sudden, I see this woman literally in the mirror facing me, but it looked like she was getting ready to walk out of it because she was getting closer. I, of course, start screaming. My cousin is on the other side of the door, desperately trying to get in. My aunt comes flying down the stairs and couldn't get the door to open either. She kept telling me to unlock it, but I was stuck, frozen in terror. Finally, she gets the door open and sees nothing. She flips the switch on and gets me out of the tub, and nothing else was really said about it. Later that week, I was again with my aunt as my mother was working. I asked if I could sleep in Grandma's bed since they weren't there, and at the time, at my little size, that bed seemed humongous. She called them in Hawaii to ask for their permission, and they said it was fine. So I'm asleep in their bed, and I'm not exactly positive if it was a dream or an actual experience that had taken place. I was in the center of the bed. From there, you could see straight into their bathroom on the right side of the room, and then straight down the hallway into the computer room. Mind you, this is on the second floor now, not the basement. In this maybe dream, the bathroom light flipped on and I could see her again coming out of the mirror. It was like I was locked in place, but I could see down the hall in the computer room my mom sitting at my grandma's computer. I tried to call her, but it came out as a dull whisper. I tried over and over, but the sound just wouldn't come out. The woman actually made it out of the mirror this time, and got just a step out of the bathroom when I was able to get unlocked, and I ran down the hallway into the room where my mother was. Again, I don't think anything was ever actually said about this. Another time, maybe two years later, my mom and I were sleeping in the basement bedroom, and the closet doors were those full floor-to-ceiling mirrors. I saw her again, but my mom was within reach, and I woke her up, and she saw this woman too, and grabbed me, and ran upstairs. I guess a more adequate name for her would be the lady in the mirror, but I've been calling her the lady in the basement for what seems like forever. I know for a fact that the cousin from the first story saw her on a number of occasions. My sister saw her, my brother saw her, and a couple of other cousins when they would visit from out of state. It really only affected us kids. Over the past couple of years, I've asked my mother if she remembers it. My sister, my aunt that would watch me, and then her son and everyone is pretty much on the same page of, this was real. My mother's theory is that she was a family member from the past that just stuck with the family, and she didn't mean to be scary, she just was, because we weren't used to seeing that sort of thing. I asked my grandpa about it last week over text if he recalls me ever saying anything to him about her, and he replied, no, and I'd prefer it if you didn't. Now, here's the kicker. My grandma passed in December of 2018. I had not seen the lady in the basement since that particular house. 
They moved houses, hell, even moved states, and I never saw her in any of the other houses. Not once. But after my grandma died, I saw her in the house that I was living in that wasn't even close to the original house where I first saw her. Now I'm wondering if my mom's theory on her being a relative that passed and just was attached to us is even true, and that when my grandma passed, she followed her, but made her rounds to say bye? Because right after I saw her at my own house, I called my sister immediately and she freaked out because she had seen her at her house the day before. I haven't seen her since, and I pray I don't see her again. Half of me wants to write a letter to the new owners of that house from my childhood and ask them if they have seen her as well. This encounter happened in the summer of 2006, when I was 20 years old. I didn't get my driver's license until January of that year, and driving opened up so many doors for me that I took a lot of solo road trips from my friends' houses in New England and the mid-Atlantic states. I also look young for my age, and was often mistaken for a high school student in my early 20s. I was driving alone on I-78 on a random July day on my way to visit my friend in southern Pennsylvania for a long weekend. Her parents were away, and we had the house to ourselves and were planning on drinking and hot tubbing, watching Planet Earth drunk. It had just come out. Maybe run around some cornfields at night. I was so excited and had a great drive listening to good music, and it was a beautiful day. Right after I crossed the border from New Jersey into Pennsylvania, I stopped at one of the rest stops to get gas and snacks for the last part of my drive. I have tried to figure out which rest stop this was and can't ID it, but it was a gas station with a large mini-mart. Opposite the gas station was the on-ramp back to I-78 West, and parallel to the on-ramp was a dirt road, which comes into play later. I was heading into the store when a man in his late 30s, early 40s approached me. He was a stocky guy, definitely tall, I'm 5'1", and had on a plain black tee and jeans with dark brown hair and a mustache slash goatee. He had come out of a black pickup truck parked a few spaces away from my car. He had a super intense gaze and immediately creeped me out. He just had a crazy energy about him. I didn't really get vibes from people that often, but this was so strange. He stood too close. His gaze was crazy direct or focused, and his word choices were strange. It immediately set off all my alarms. He asked if I was from the area, despite my Connecticut license plate, where I was headed, and if I knew of anything fun to do because he had plans later and time to kill beforehand. He invited me to go play mini golf or watch a movie with him. I didn't answer any of his questions, declined his invitation to hang out, and told him I didn't know the area and walked away toward the store. I was blown away that he had asked me to go anywhere with him. It was so random and uncomfortable. As I was walking away, he actually screamed out, you're gorgeous, and the volume and tone made my hair stand on end. It was super aggressive and inappropriate, and he even startled a family who was walking out of the store because it was so loud. I didn't turn around, but went inside. He came into the store shortly after and was staring at me, so I went to use the bathroom and stayed in for at least 10 minutes texting my friend about this creep. When I came out, he wasn't in the store anymore, so I took my time buying drinks and snacks and went out to gas my car up. I was relieved that his car was gone and started thinking about the rest of my drive and again getting excited to see my friend. When I pull up the road to get back onto the highway, I hear someone persistently honking his horn and see this creep show on the dirt road parallel to the on-ramp in his truck honking, shouting, and waving at me to drive over in his direction. He was directly facing the gas station and had been waiting for me. I immediately freaked out and jumped on the on-ramp back to I-78. He pulled out onto the highway after me and I called my friend extremely scared. I drove so fast, and probably dangerously, and looking back, I'm lucky that I didn't either get into an accident or pulled over, but I didn't know what else to do. He didn't follow me for that long, and I think after a few exits, he pulled off. 
My friend and I had a backup plan that if I saw his car again, she would direct me to a police station the next town over from her house instead of my going directly there and leading some freak to us. I didn't see the car again and continued on my journey, but the last few hours of my drive I was extremely tense and anxious. I remember checking my mirrors regularly for this black pickup truck. It all ended well. I got to my friend's house safely and we had a lovely weekend. The encounter was definitely creepy, but over the years I didn't put much thought into it. A few years ago, in 2014, I was talking with another friend who is big into serial killers and mentioned my encounter jokingly suggesting that this was a serial killer I had met and told her my experience. She was fascinated and wanted to Google active serial killers in the Pennsylvania area at the time. The first hit was for Adam Leroy Lane and he looked almost exactly like the man that I had met back in 2006. Obviously, it could be my mind filling in the blanks, but the basic characteristics 40, tall but stocky, brown hair with a mustache, goatee, and the time and area all match. In my memory, he was a little bit slimmer than the pictures, and it was 2006, not 2007, when he was actually convicted of murdering women. Still, it's an odd coincidence, and one I have definitely never forgotten. The scariest thing that ever happened to me came from the person closest to me. My ex-husband and I were both only 19 when we married. When we first met, everything was glorious. I moved in with him and his family because me and mine were having a lot of trouble at the time, and for the first year, all was golden. Then one day, his stepdad went missing. The police found his body almost a week later, murdered. The tragedy tore through the three of them, Nikki, his mother, and sister, with an intensity similar to a massive hurricane. If Nikki's biological father had been present, that might have been one thing, but that piece of human excrement was not just absent, but only made the occasional appearance to steal one of the kids' social security checks from the mail on arrival, and that was usually when he knew no one would be home. When Fiona married Dave, he had become their father the only father they ever really had. He was their true family. After the homicide, Nikki's whole personality shifted toward darkness. He would rant and rave like a man possessed and become violent if I didn't do everything he told me to do, no matter what it was. To this day, I have scars from a physical altercation with his sister on being commanded to attack her and having no choice but to do so, for example. The scars make me who I am now, a survivor, but I wouldn't wish what I went through on anyone. Being terrified for your life every single day and never knowing if any given moment could lead to your last is exhausting and traumatizing to say the least. One day we got into it so badly that I told him I wanted to divorce. He kicked me out of my own car at my parents' house and tore out of the driveway, spraying gravel everywhere and leaving puffs of dust floating up toward the sky. I was utterly distraught by the entire situation at that point, completely at my wit's end. Yet for some reason, I still loved him, still wanted to make things work out and for us to be together. So when he called and begged for the chance just to talk things over, of course I agreed and went outside to anxiously await his return to pick me up. I expected him to have calmed down by the time he arrived. At least, that was what his tone had suggested over the phone. But when I got in the car, the whole vibe felt off. Chaotic. The tension was almost physically too much to handle. We rode in silence for about five minutes before he shot me a quick glare and then returned his attention to the road. His dark eyes drilled right through me, their anger giving off a certain glint like that of coal. You know you're my wife, right? He asked in a syrupy, sickly sweet voice. That means you belong to me. I didn't really know how to respond, so I said nothing. My mind turned a thousand miles an hour, deciphering what he was telling me, though. 
His level of possessiveness over me had steadily increased in the past six months or so after Dave's death, as if he were terrified of me disappearing along with the glue that had held together his tiny little broken family. My subconscious screamed at me that the whole thing had been a ruse, a trick to lure me back into the car. I looked down at my hands in my lap, wringing them together until my knuckles turned red. I thought you wanted to fix things, I said. He smirked, and my gut went cold. My worst fears confirmed in that twisted, psychotic expression of his. What do you think this is? He replied. It feels like a trick, I told him. He pursed his lips together, his grip tightening on the steering wheel. His shoulders tensed and his expression grew more malvoyant than ever. That's because it was a trick, he murmured. If I can't have you, no one can. Until the moment he said those words aloud, I always thought of that expression as one of those you only ever hear or read in fiction. It never occurred to me that there was a reason that it existed. Someone, or many others most likely, who had heard the phrase and felt the sheer horror that accompanied its implication. In the course of our relationship, I endured punches, kicks, two totaled cars, and multiple death threats. A couple of weeks after this incident, I finally managed to get away from him for good. I stayed the night at a friend's house after getting what little things I needed. She lived not far from his grandparents, but I didn't really think anything of it because the neighborhood is one of those upscale, quiet, safe kind of suburbs. We partied most of the night. She went upstairs to sleep around one and left me on the couch in the living room watching TV, willing myself to pass out. About an hour later, around 2 a.m., I felt like someone was watching me. I looked over at the sliding doors to my left that led out into the backyard. And there he was. He was standing outside, in the dark, in the rain, watching me and crying with his fists clenched. I felt my eyes grow wide, and I sank slowly down into the leather cushions as if they could make me disappear from sight. I don't know how much longer he was there. When I looked again, he was gone. The next day, my mom came to get me, because he wrecked my car so I no longer had a ride. He was standing at the corner staring at her as she drove past. We had to get a police escort to take us straight to the station to get a restraining order. I spent the next year getting the divorce straightened out and getting the rest of my belongings that he was trying to hold hostage, like my birth certificate, diploma, and social security card. I spent the next six years, even after entering into a wonderful and truly loving relationship, in fear that he would come for me. Even now, eight years later, sometimes he will still try to contact me through other people or fake accounts on social media. Sometimes the most unsuspecting person is the one you have to worry about. Sometimes all it takes is one tragedy to twist a person completely inside and turn them into a monster on the outside. I wanted to start this off with a trigger warning, as it does speak of suicide. There isn't any detail of how this person died, but I know that this subject is hard to read about and listen to for others. Back in 2018, I met a really sweet girl at my church, and we became pretty good friends. We would sit by each other or nearby every service. We attended canned food drives to help others around Thanksgiving. We sat together with a few older couples at church lunches, but we weren't close outside of that. At one point, we had each other's Snapchats before I deleted mine. The week before my birthday, I went to church as normal, ate breakfast with another friend of mine and her kids, and made my way to the sanctuary. I saw Lily sitting on the right-hand side of the aisle, and I sat next to her. We talked for a bit before the service started. However, halfway through, she got a phone call and left. She didn't come back, so I figured that she had had a family emergency or had to go to work early. 
I finished up at church, talked to my pastor and his family, and then headed home to give a couple piano lessons. Nothing else odd or weird crossed my mind. I just carried on with my week until next Sunday. The following Sunday happened to be my birthday. I was excited because it was my golden birthday. The year of 25. I don't usually like to celebrate, but this was going to be a good one. I'm a newlywed spending the day with my husband and having my favorite coconut cream pie instead of cake. I still wanted to go to church that morning, though. I love my church and church family and spending time with them. From the minute the church doors opened, everything was off. I went down to the basement and had a cup of cold coffee, a bagel, and I noticed a few people around me who were just pale, cold. I can't even properly describe the sadness on their faces. I'm a pretty introverted person, so I didn't ask any questions. I just went back upstairs to the sanctuary and waited for the service to start. My pastor walked up to the podium with tears in his eyes. He began telling us about how there was a tragedy within the church. Lily had committed suicide the weekend prior, Friday night to be specific. I started crying uncontrollably. I didn't know that she had been dealing with thoughts of suicide, and I felt like an awful friend. We had a beautiful service dedicated to her before her funeral. We all sang songs that she loved, prayed for her mother and family, and prayed for her. I left right after church. I went straight home. I didn't think about the details of her death because it just hurt too much. A few hours later, though, I remembered the previous Sunday. I had seen her at church. How was that possible, though? She passed away Friday night, but I somehow saw her on Sunday. I sat right next to her. We talked before service started. I watched her answer her phone and walk out. I became angry, scared, disappointed, depressed, every emotion that comes with losing a friend at such a young age. I fell into a hole. After I had grieved and prayed for a couple days, something came to me. My church does live streams, and there would have been a clear view of our service and us sitting next to each other. I logged onto my Facebook, found my church's page, and started searching for the date that I had last seen her. The strangest part of everything is, every live stream is in chronological order, so I figured that it would be pretty easy to find. But to this day, I still haven't found it. I asked the person in charge of recording and uploading the sermons on Facebook where it was, and he said that somehow that there had been technical difficulties that day, and that they were unable to stream the service or even catch any audio. This has racked my brain for months. To this day, I feel as if she had been there on church that Sunday to say goodbye to me. I asked other members if they had seen her the week before, and they all said that they couldn't remember if they had, or they corrected me by saying, Honey, she passed away last Friday night. There's no way she could have been there. My church is fairly small, and we only have a morning Sunday service, so there's no possible way that I could have gotten my days mixed up. I've had many ghostly encounters in my life. Way too many for me to even count. I'm going to continue to write about all of them because writing about it honestly is the only thing that brings me peace and sanity. This one hits the hardest though. I wish I had more answers than I do or some sort of proof, but I don't. I didn't have any eerie feelings when I last spoke with her. She didn't feel like a ghost or an apparition. I feel like she was truly there without a doubt I hope that one day I can find some answers, or an explanation at least. But for now, I have to keep telling myself that this is how Lily decided to say goodbye to me, and learn to be okay with it. I was raised in a house that had a few spirits in it. My family are all skeptics and would always find a way to explain things. A few experiences and then I'll get to the main story. 1. Our house had three stories with technically three master bathrooms, one on each floor. 
The one on the main floor we used as an office. I would constantly hear someone walking around in the office at night, sinks turning on, toilets flushing, and occasionally taking. My parents would always say that someone was awake and making those noises, and the toilet and water running was just faulty pipes. Two. There would always be a shadow figure that would pace on the top floor. There was a balcony that overlooked the foyer, and I would usually see who I presumed was a lady in a dress, pacing back and forth. My parents just said that it was the shadow of someone outside. We were on a hill, overlooking all of our neighbors. I don't know how they thought this was possible. 3. I hated using the upstairs bathroom, which was my bathroom. I would hear talking and singing from that bathroom. When no one was home and I was in there, someone would bang on the door. One time I was showering and listening to music. I heard the banging sound so loud that it shook the room. And then the locked door swung open and I heard a scream. My parents said that my brother was pranking me, which is something that he never did. Anyways, on to the main event. My brother is about 10 years older than me. He was the only sibling living at home with me and my parents. He had the master bedroom in the basement. I was never really in the basement except for going to the garage because it was in the basement next to the bedroom. I always remember feeling uneasy down there, though. But I wanted a big room, so when my brother moved out, I begged my parents to let me have his room. And eventually they caved. I moved all my stuff downstairs, painted and everything. I loved it. I was talking to my brother about it one day, and he told me, watch out for the little girl who lives down there. She likes to laugh. I was shocked, as obviously he had to be kidding. My whole family besides me never talked about stuff like that. I just kind of giggled and shrugged it off. He was probably just trying to scare me. About a week after I moved into my new room, I had a friend come over. We were just laying on the floor next to the bathroom laughing when she had to go to the bathroom. She closed the door and I was just zoning out when all of a sudden she goes, That's not funny. I asked her what she was talking about, as I hadn't done anything. She said that she heard someone laughing right outside the door, but I didn't do anything or hear anything. She left freaked out, and I assumed that my brother had put her up to it since she liked him. A few days later, I hear someone in my bedroom while I'm in the shower. I call out thinking it's my mom, but I don't hear a response. I get out, and as I'm putting on my robe, I hear a little girl's giggle and then... Are you looking for me? I freak out. I throw open the door to my room, but no one is there. I checked the garage and ended up setting off the house alarm so no one could have come or gone through the doors without everyone knowing. I run upstairs and my mom is pissed that I set off the alarm and I tell her what just happened. She told me my brother had a similar story when we first moved in, but that it was nothing. I called my brother and asked him why he told me to watch out for the little girl. He said that I was the little girl. He was kidding because, quote unquote, you would always come downstairs and giggle really creepy. I never did anything like that. I told him that, and he got creeped out. I still would occasionally hear the little girl. I never saw her, but she did like to laugh and open the bathroom and closet doors. I named her Sarah. My brother called me up today and asked me about this. He asked me if I was sure that I never tried to scare him by laughing, and I told him no. He got really uncomfortable. I don't think he knows how to handle the fact that our house is haunted. This happened back when I was a freshman in high school. I had this friend who lived next door to me and asked me to accompany him to Dairy Queen to buy a vape from some girl from his school. We'll call him Tyler. After school, I met up with Tyler at our apartment complex since school had just let out for him as well. We walked to Dairy Queen, which was about a mile and a half, roughly, up the street. This was in the middle of winter, so it was very cold and rainy. The walk took about 30 minutes. We arrived at the Dairy Queen and waited for an hour for this girl who never showed up. She eventually texted Tyler after an hour of telling him she was getting ready and said that she was unable to get a ride, which was total BS, because she apparently lived right by the Dairy Queen. 
We were annoyed and started our walk back home. We were talking about how we were going to hit the hot tub when we returned. Now, for some understanding, there is a large Walmart that you had to get past to get to the Dairy Queen. Before you get to the Walmart, there's another apartment complex that we also had to pass. A girl named Carly lived there and was dating our friend named Dre. We stopped at her apartment because Tyler saw her outside taking her trash out and wanted to flirt with her, which is something he would do with every girl that he came across. She was visibly upset, and you could tell that she had been crying. She told Tyler that Dre had dumped her. Now for a bit of context, Dre was once friends with Tyler, but they had a falling out a few days prior to this story. We all three would hang out at the apartment complex that Tyler and I lived at, and Dre was actually a longtime family friend of mine, too. After a few minutes of Tyler and Carly chatting, we finally left and headed home. As we were about to pass Walmart, there was a big bush on the sidewalk in front of the Walmart. As we were walking, we saw two dark figures emerge from behind the bush and look in our direction. Tyler had a lot of enemies, so he was paranoid that there was someone coming after him. I told him not to worry, as it could have been anyone, and it was probably just some random homeless people as this area was full of random transients. He suggested we cut through the back alley behind Walmart because he was fully convinced it was someone who wanted to jump him. I'll admit, I was a bit nervous myself as I wasn't sure what kind of enemies that he had or what they wanted and I was afraid that they might do something to me since I was with Tyler, which in hindsight was probably a bit selfish, but I was a kid. We decided to just continue down the sidewalk we were on and take our chances agreeing to just book it if they tried anything. The closer we got, the sketchier the whole situation became because these people just kept peeking around the bushes at us. Once we got to the bush, I was surprised to see Dre and a well-known thug, future murderer, named D, come out from behind it. Dre looked pissed, and D had a weird grin on his face that made me know that they were up to no good. I also noticed that D was holding his cell phone at a weird angle, like he was recording or something. That made me extremely nervous. Dre and Dee just walked up to us on the sidewalk, with Dee still awkwardly smirking, and Dre asked where we were coming from. I didn't say anything, as I didn't want to be involved in the beef that Dre and Tyler had with each other. Tyler began to try and explain to Dre that we were coming back from Dairy Queen and that we had run into Dre's girlfriend, Carly, and that Carly was upset over their breakup. Dre didn't believe him, and accused him of trying to hit on her. He said that they never broke up, and accused Tyler of lying. Tyler attempted to get me involved by looking at me as if he expected me to confirm that Carly, in fact, had said that they broke up. I froze and just shrugged my shoulders and tried to make it clear that I wanted no part of anything. Dre didn't say anything for a few seconds, and then after an awkward silence, Tyler attempted to part ways and walk up the street after saying goodbye. All of a sudden, Dre shoved Tyler to the ground and then sucker punched him in his face as he crawled back to his feet. D began hysterically laughing in a very menacing way, and I just stood there looking at Dre, waiting for him to come after me next. You see, the night before this, I had gotten into it with Dre over a text and called him a little bitch because he wouldn't forgive Tyler. I know that was immature now. He walked past me without doing anything and walked up the street in the opposite direction. Now, by this point, Tyler was hysteric and started running up the street yelling at me to come on or they would get me and I was trying to keep up with him. He yelled at me for not helping him. At that moment, Tyler's mom pulled up next to us and we got into her car and she drove us home. He was crying and he told her what had happened. She seemed kind of dismissive about the whole thing and said to just stay away from Dre. I was just happy to be away from the situation. Tyler went straight to his house and didn't talk to me again for a few days. I guess he was still mad at me about not helping him. In my defense, everything happened so fast that I didn't really know what to do. Dre ended up texting me after I got home just saying, Hey, but I ignored it. The next encounter with Dee was a bit more alarming as he apparently did indeed want to get me next. Tyler and I were just hanging out at the apartments one day when he got a text from one of his friends that Dre and Dee were smoking weed at the supermarket right next door to the apartments. 
Apparently, Dre told Dee about how I was best friends with Tyler and had been quote-unquote talking smack, to which Dee responded by suggesting that they walk over to my apartments to beat me up. Dre told him no, because we were family friends, so that was the end of that. I didn't see Dee again until high school when he was put into my algebra class. He walked into the classroom with that same creepy smile on his face that he always seemed to have and sat down across from my desk. He turned to me during a quiz and asked me if I remember him, to which I replied the affirmative. He asked me if I remember Dre, and when Dre punched Tyler, and once again, I said yes. This kid went on about how he enjoyed watching Dre do that to Tyler, and he actually had two knives in his pocket that day and wanted to use them on Tyler, but Dre wouldn't let him. So fast forward to 2018, I was walking around Sears with my fiancé trying to find baby clothes for our son, who was due soon. I hadn't heard anything about Dre or Dee since high school, and I received a text from an old buddy from school telling me that Dee got arrested for allegedly shooting some girl in the back of the head at a party. Apparently, she refused to sell him cocaine, so he shot her in a fit of rage. He fled the scene and was arrested soon after that on attempted murder charges, since the girl survived. She ended up making a full recovery. This wasn't even the first time Dee has shot someone. A year prior, he had shot some kid in the leg during a drug deal gone bad. I'm not sure if Dre is still friends with Dee, but as far as I know, he's not involved in the things he used to be involved with. So to the psycho who plotted to jump me and shot two people, let's not meet again. In 2015, I worked a couple weeks at one of those Halloween stores that are in town for the season. This particular location was in an old Kmart building that had been empty for a number of years. A particular problem for this building was the homeless population breaking in to have a safe place to sleep out of the cold. My first day, I was put in the back area, shuffling stock onto pegs. Being my first day, I hadn't met everyone, so when I saw movement out of my peripheral vision, I didn't pay much attention to it. Way off in the back corner of the building, outside the double doors going into the old stock room, I saw a man. He was very tall, maybe six foot three, Hispanic, with long curly dark hair, a dark complexion, white t-shirt, and blue jeans. I figured it was simply a co-worker that I hadn't yet met and didn't think anything of it. A few moments later, I looked up, and the fellow was gone. A shift later, I'm an opener. Our manager tasks a co-worker and I with going into the old stock room to look for a cart, for stock. We get back there, and a motion-activated light in the hallway on the other side of a swinging door turns on. Then the next. Then the next. My co-worker freaks and says, Oh crap, it's probably another homeless person who broke in. Come on, let's go catch them and make sure the back door is locked. So we chase after the movement. We get into the hall, which has a door on either side, to see no one. But in the next area, where the back door is, the light's turned on. We run in there, and a stairwell leads up from this area to the old offices. The lights going up the stairs start turning on like someone is going up, but there is no one there. Not a rat, a moth, or so much as a cockroach to trigger the motion sensors. We double check the back door, and it is securely chained and locked. My co-worker turns white as a sheet and says, that's it. I am done. We're the hell out of here. A shift or two later, I ended up in the back area again, shuffling stock around. From my peripheral vision, I see the same man again, but this time he's maybe 15 feet away. I pay attention this time and could make out the detail pretty well. His clothes were dirty and he wasn't wearing shoes. The guy was just standing there though, not moving. After a few unnerving moments of seeing him there in my peripheral vision, I look directly at him, and he's no longer there. That's odd, I thought, not connecting the dots. I just shrug it off and continue working. My final shift was on Halloween. I'm sorting merch between carts, putting broken stuff in one cart and resellable stuff in the other. 
The next thing I know, someone is standing a foot away, directly in front of me. Looking down at the cart between us, I can see him perfectly out of the corner of my eye. I could see the grime on his clothes. I could see his breathing. I knew in that moment, if I looked up, he wouldn't be there. I suddenly got irrationally angry, a type of anger I've never felt. I said to him without even thinking, I know what you are, I know what you're trying to do. I'm not afraid of you. You are not welcome here. By the power of the priesthood, I command you to leave. Now. He growls one guttural growl, and then is gone. No fading out, no puff of wind and smoke. Just gone. At my current job, a year or two later, one of my co-workers and good friends is a devout Catholic. I told him about the ghost of the homeless guy in the Kmart building, and he just stands there and stares at me. Do you have any idea what you did and how dangerous it was? You exercised it. You're not a priest. You should have never been able to do that. You're damn lucky it was just a ghost and not a demon. I never even considered that, nor did I consider my words before I spoke them to the ghost. It was spontaneous, like muscle memory or like I was being guided. My friend still says I was lucky, and not to do some stupid crap like that again. I live in the basement of my parents-in-law's house, and my wife never goes down to my room. I'm almost always in there alone. Since I've lived there, a few things have been happening that I dismissed as ventilation or something or other, such as my door slowly creeping open. Frankly, I wouldn't even have noticed something opening if it weren't for the green indicator light of something I have plugged into the wall outside my room. At night, if I have to leave my room, I exit and make an immediate left and dip into the bathroom. I can almost always sense an entity in the living area or bar area of the basement. This feeling is compounded when I exit the bathroom and my reflection appears on the wall of our sliding doors. Sometimes, I do not have a face in my reflection. I quickly re-enter my bedroom and shut and lock the door. Some nights there's a knocking from within my mattress that wakes me up, usually between 3 and 3.15 a.m. I have no way of dealing with this other than risking it and fleeing upstairs to my son's room. My son, 3, has autism and frequently says that's scary over and over in the basement while looking toward the bathroom and living areas. The light switches that I have access to when leaving the room frequently cease to function right when I need them or will flicker out almost violently as I'm on the staircase halfway up and out of the basement. I can hear rustling in the middle of the night sometimes as well, and I occasionally convince myself that it's just a mouse. Lately, this has graduated to the sound of footsteps in the ceiling in the middle of the night. Most recently, when I heard these footsteps, there was no one home but me, and I searched the house wielding a knife for an intruder to find no one home. I think that this entity is aware that I know it exists, and I interacted with it via the mirror once, and it contorted my face. My ex-fiancé and his stepmom claimed that his house was haunted. Once or twice a week when I would come over, they would be burning sage next to the door. I never thought anything of it. Connor and I would be cuddling on the couch late at night, 10 or 12 p.m., and we would hear footsteps, but we always just assumed it was his sisters waking up to use the restroom. Anyways, it was Halloween and I decided to do a spirit box session with Connor's high-power microphone. I'd record for a couple minutes, then listen back to the recording. I did this for a half hour and got nothing. Then I began to taunt whatever it was in the house. I was claiming BS, but nothing was there. I decided to leave the microphone running for longer than normal, roughly 15 minutes instead of 5. I can't remember what I heard in the playback audio, but it was more than just Connor and my voices. I rewound it again to see if we could decipher what the voices were saying. 
I remember something that felt like a rush of cold as ice wind coming over me and I couldn't talk. My left arm clenched up as it does when I'm extremely cold. I tried to explain what was going on, but I couldn't get the words out of my mouth. Connor thought I was just messing with him and told me to stop acting and relax. He tried to force my arm to unclench, but I was able to fight his strength, which had never happened before. I started to panic, and the rest of my body curled into a tensed fetal position. He tried to get me to uncurl, but it still didn't work. I couldn't mutter anything except for Hosanna. This phrase, Hosanna, was the only word I could speak for a solid five minutes while this was taking place. I was honestly terrified of what was happening. What scared me was that I could not understand it. I kept saying it quietly, but getting louder the more that I said it. Connor kept asking me what it meant, and I couldn't even bring my tongue to say that until the room became warm again. Then I was finally able to untense my muscles and sit up, and he asked me again what Hosanna meant. In Hebrew, it means, God save us, God help us, God deliver us. I was so afraid that I went home and slept with my room light on for the rest of the night. I spoke with him about the incident the following morning, and he told me that he had warned me not to mess with the spirits in the house. He did no such thing, ever. He even gave me the microphone so that I could do EVP sessions on Halloween. This is a warning. Please, please, never taunt spirits. It doesn't matter if you think they are friendly or not. They will mess you up. I have a story of the first time that I saw a ghost in full body manifestation. It was to the point where they looked human. I've had other encounters and experiences before and all were shadowy horrors, but not this ghost. It almost felt like a guardian angel, so this was very strange. When I was baptized, I was told to walk into the back area of the stage where I would wait to make my entrance into the baptismal pool. As I opened the door from the back area, I was greeted by a guy who was wearing a Hawaiian shirt and a straw fedora, holding a towel. He was just sitting there on a wooden box with a cane. I didn't think anything of it at the time, but then I realized that he was sitting at least three feet from the ground with his feet in the air. I figured that he must have been a spry old man, but at the same time I was confused as to why he was holding a cane in the first place. He handed me the towel and told me not to worry and not to be nervous. It was very warming and relaxing hearing him tell me that. Afterwards, I heard the cue for my name and went out and I was baptized. When I was done changing, I walked into my minister's office and asked who the guy was. She had no idea who I was talking about, but as she said that, I immediately noticed a portrait on the wall of the man who had given me the towel. In the portrait, he was wearing a suit instead, but the face was definitely the same. I pointed at the photo and said, Him? Who's that guy? Is he the chairman of the board? She said, No, he's a founding member of this church. He passed away a long time ago. I was so baffled. I told her it had to have been him, that it had just happened no less than 20 minutes ago. I went back to the place where he was, and there was a shelf of blankets and towels sitting on top of the box that he was sitting on. All I could think of in total shock was that there was no way that old man had propped that up there by himself in the last 15 minutes, and I quickly prayed and thanked him. After that, I've never had a similar experience. I still only ever encounter negative energy-driven entities in shadows, not pure ones like him. Several years ago, I worked at a crisis unit for the acutely mentally ill. 
It was a 10-bed unit where individuals would come stay as a step down from a psychiatric hospitalization or a diversion to prevent psychiatric hospitalization. I often worked alone on the weekends. One Friday evening we received an admission, Michael. Background info was provided with the referral indicating a diagnosis of antisocial personality disorder and his recent release from prison after serving a sentence for murder. I completed the initial intake meeting with Michael, during which time he said some sexually explicit things to me. I made it clear that this was inappropriate and that confidentiality was limited and that the staff working on the unit as part of his treatment team would be privy to anything said in the interview or subsequent one-on-one -on -one sessions. He responded well to the redirection, which we finished the intake and I went about the rest of my shift until about 11 p.m. that night when he approached the office and asked if I was working alone. Luckily, at the time I wasn't alone and I told him my male co-worker was in the adjoining office. After this encounter, I explained the situation to my co-worker, who read my shift summary and decided to sit down with Michael and tell him that the way he was acting was not acceptable and that he could risk being released from the program if it continued. The next morning, I was working alone from 8 to 4 p.m. Around 9 a.m., I went to wake up another client, Jeremy, to administer his medications. The room Jeremy was assigned to was at the end of the hallway, and he was actually slow to get up in the mornings. While I was knocking on Jeremy's door, Michael approached me to tell me that he didn't appreciate that I had shared the things he said to me with my male co-worker. I explained to Michael that he knew what he said was inappropriate, and that he knew anything he said to me would be shared with the rest of the treatment team. Michael became more agitated and got in my face, backing me into the corner in front of Jeremy's bedroom door. At this point, Jeremy had woken up and heard what was happening outside of his room. He came out, stood between Michael and myself, and told Michael that he needed to walk away and cool down. Michael went back to his room and I contacted my supervisor who told me to document the encounter and continue my shift. Needless to say, I left that job shortly after this incident. I'm thankful for Jeremy and that he had the presence of mind while also being a client with a mental illness to intervene on my behalf. I often wonder what would have happened if Jeremy wouldn't have woken up, or if he would have been in a more severe state of mental illness and would have become more agitated as well. Michael, let's never meet again. This happened today at a church that I took my grandma to. I haven't been since I was a kid and figured it might be nice to go again. At first the church seemed very homey. I come from a small town in Kentucky but live in a city now so I really enjoyed the change of pace. A lot of people at the church also used to live in Kentucky and still have family there which made it feel as if there were a small piece of home right there with me. The service was short and simple. They started out with praise and worship, followed by prayer. After the prayer, they opened the side door and invited God, the Holy Spirit, and his angels into the church. Then they had an evangelist come in and preach a sermon. I was getting weird vibes at this point for whatever reason. I figured it was because I hadn't been to church in so long, and it had to do with a few personal reasons from my last church experiences. I was sort of zoning out while the evangelist had the stage. He got really into his sermon. He was yelling and putting his arm out toward us. Mid screaming slash preaching, his microphone messed up and it made him sound demonic and loud. I know technical issues like that can happen, so I didn't think anything of it. He changes his microphone and carries on. While he's going on again, there's knocking at the side door and all of a sudden it just flies open. I initially chalked it up to the wind, but the lights began to flicker as he continued talking. Everyone kept praising God and saying that the spirit was in the church. They really seemed to enjoy these things that were happening. After the service was over, the preacher's wife went up to the podium and said that while all the weird stuff was happening, that she could hear everything upstairs. She also said that while she was up there that she saw things running past out of the corner of her eye and that a door had been slammed in her face. Not quite sure what to think of all this. 
I've never experienced anything in a public place like that, and definitely never expected to in a church. Like I said, everyone was really into it, and said that it was God, or angels. I'm an open and spiritual person and have experienced a lot of paranormal, but I didn't feel that whatever that was, was a good thing. I felt bad vibes before things started happening. Vibes that I continued to feel up until we left there. My first paranormal encounter occurred on October 31st of 2009. A week prior to Halloween, we had made plans. We heard rumors that the cemetery above our neighborhood was haunted. Some of the stories sounded legit, others sounded highly exaggerated, so me, my cousin Dustin, William, and Tommy decided to go find out for ourselves on the perfect day. Halloween night. Jason didn't find out until the day we were going up there. We weren't planning on having him go with us because he would always get scared so easily, but he begged and begged to let him come, so we said okay. Halloween night, we had a small campfire at my aunt's house that was in her backyard. After sitting there until 11.30 p.m., we grabbed our flashlights and homemade med kits. We walked from my aunt's backyard up through the woods on a big hill until we reached the cemetery. William and Jason argued for a minute about who was going in which direction to check out which parts of the cemetery. Jason didn't want to go with Tommy because he was worried that Tommy would scare him, as Tommy had a reputation for doing such. My two cousins and I began making our way through the cemetery, and we didn't notice anything until we got near the mausoleum at the top. We started getting chills, and then we started hearing the voice of an elderly man saying, Get out. I want you out. As we moved forward, the voice became more aggressive. Get the hell out of here. I want you out. I shined my flashlight around, and standing between a tree and the mausoleum was an old man. The three of us just stood there in shock. He looked to be in his 80s. He had a black suit on, glasses, and he just looked down at us with this angry glare. His mouth wasn't moving, but we kept hearing what we assumed was his voice. The three of us slowly backed up and started walking down to the lower part of the cemetery to meet back up with Jason and Tommy. What we didn't know at the time was that Jason and Tommy were on the other side of the cemetery heading to the upper part of the cemetery to find us. We got midway through and there was an area in the middle with three tall spruce trees and we saw four shadow figures moving back and forth between the trees and the tombstones. It wasn't like they were running, more like gliding, and they would just disappear behind the stones and the trees. By this time we began to hear voices again. We just wanted to get out of there, but we weren't going to leave Tommy and Jason behind. As we were walking we heard them screaming in pure fear. We immediately started running back up towards the mausoleum calling out to them, and I started waving my flashlight as we were running. I look up ahead, and I can see them running toward us. When the five of us got together, Jason was crying. I asked what happened, and Tommy just kept insisting that he swore he didn't do anything. I look over at Jason and ask him. He was crying so hard he could barely speak. I gave him a quick shake and he said something grabbed me and pushed me down. Then Tommy said, We were looking around the mausoleum looking for you guys and all of a sudden Jason's on the ground kicking and screaming. He proceeded to say that he saw an old man standing at the tree line about 20 feet away telling them to get out. Jason stood there shaking and crying. I rolled up his sleeve and we shined our lights and saw a red handprint on his forearm. Dustin said, okay, that's it. We're done. Let's get out of here. We started walking down and we saw the old man standing in the middle of the gravel path, only this time he looked worn down. We immediately ran the other way, and there he stood again, right in front of us, and this time he looked even worse. He slowly pointed at us and said, get out, you dirty little shits. 
I screamed at him that we were leaving, and we hauled ass out of the cemetery, down through the woods, back into my aunt's backyard. We sat on her porch, trying to process what had just happened. It was almost 1am, so we decided to head in for the night. William and I went into my house, and my dad was sitting on the living room couch. He asked where we had been. We told him that we were up in the cemetery, and that it was indeed haunted, and we informed him of everything that we had seen. He, of course, didn't believe us. He told us that we just needed to go and get some rest. We stayed up until 3 a.m. and began even questioning our sanity. I had suspicions that there's more to this world than just us, but William was a complete skeptic. He didn't believe in anything paranormal. Until that night. About a month before I wrote this on here, my dad and I were hanging out and he brought up that Halloween night, and as we were talking about it, his demeanor changed. He asked, When you said that the cemetery was haunted and I said that it wasn't, I lied. It is haunted. I know about the old man up there, because both your mother and I saw him when we were kids. I asked if he knew anything else about him, who he was, or why he was there, but he didn't. He said that all he could tell me was that he does not want anyone up there, especially at night. This story happened in October of 2004, back when I was still a third year high school student. My friends and I stuck around the school late at night after our annual Halloween party. We had agreed to try out my friend's Ouija board. It wasn't the brightest idea, but we needed a thrill. We found a nice spot under a huge Nara tree and proceeded with our half-assed ritual. There were about five of us, two boys and three girls. We were all expecting some kind of paranormal contact. Rumors had it that our school was haunted, but we'd never really experienced anything firsthand, and it was Halloween when all the spirits came out to play. We all wanted to get spooked. Also, we've never seen a Ouija board firsthand before, so we were really stoked. Our school was an old Spanish colonial house built in the 1800s when the Spaniards still occupied the Philippines. We were in a section of the school that doesn't get used often. Located beside a creepy old Jesuit house, people only go there when they needed to use the restroom, store equipment on one of the sheds, or make out with their boyfriend slash girlfriend. We sat down in the middle of an open space, with only an exposed, bare bulb nearby illuminating our surroundings. We were all having a laugh scaring each other with what-if scenarios. It was your typical dumb kids doing dumb things kind of night. My friend who brought the Ouija board proceeded to place it in the middle of our circle. If I remember correctly, it was the glow-in-the-dark version, which we found hilarious. But it did give us the ability to see what was written in the dark. Not knowing what to do, and going after what we've only seen in movies, we all proceeded to place our index finger on top of the planchette. We sat there looking at each other until one of us said, What's next? We didn't know if there was a proper way to start the ritual. Plus, the board didn't come with instructions, so we decided to just throw in a question. Is anyone there? I called into the darkness. If there are any spirits living here, please speak to us. One of the girls joined in. We clearly had no idea what we were doing. And still, nothing happened. Not even the slightest bit of wind. One of my friends jerked the planchette, and the girl who brought the Ouija board screamed, breaking the silence. We all laughed at how ridiculous that it was. After a bit more joking around, we decided to give it another go. We all placed our index fingers on the planchette once more and asked, If there's anyone there, we would like to make contact. Don't break the circle, one of my friends jokingly said. Shut up. I whispered. We were just about to get ready to give up when the wind started to pick up. The stillness broke and the darkness around us seemed to move. Just a coincidence, we thought. Okay, don't break the circle, I said. Is anyone there? I was excited. It was like a scene from a film with dirt and dead leaves swirling all around us. 
Guys, I'm scared, my friend sitting beside me said. My mom warned me about playing with forces that we don't know. Did you die here? I asked. Were you killed during the war? Are you the headless priest that roams these halls? Do you know Jose Ritzel, our national hero? Are you a hottie? My friend giggled. At this point, we were all throwing out random, stupid questions, and there was still nothing. This is bull. I don't want to do this anymore, my friend said, exasperated. We were all thinking the same thing. Just then, a group of dogs from the neighboring house started barking at us through the chain-link fence. These six dogs were growling and showing teeth. We all screamed, and without finishing the ritual, bolted right out of there. We didn't see each other until after Halloween break, and this is where the story gets really creepy. One of the girls told us about a weird experience she had the night after playing with the Ouija board. She had gotten home late after hanging out with her friends from the neighborhood when she realized she forgot the keys to her house. So she called up her brother, who was then still sharing a room with her, and what he said crept the hell out of her. He swore that she was already home. He claimed to have seen her walk in a while ago and that she looked really tired and that he saw her head straight to bed. Weird, but no need to freak ourselves out was all we really thought about it. Besides, her brother must have just been tired and seeing things. But then my other friend started telling us about an encounter that she had that Halloween night. She was going up to her room when the lights began to flicker as she was ascending the staircase. She shrugged it off, blaming it on faulty wiring. But just then, she saw the door to her room open and a dark figure stepped out and stood atop their staircase. She couldn't make out the entity's face, but she recounted that she couldn't move and felt utter dread as the figure stared down at her. No way, my best friend who just joined in the conversation said in disbelief. Something happened to me as well. He recalled that he was sleeping one night when he woke up feeling really uncomfortable. He described his vision as having TV-like static and that there was a feeling of heaviness that surrounded him. He looked around the room and that's when he saw a bloody, charred face with piercing red eyes grinning at him through the window. I couldn't believe what I was hearing because I had an almost run-in with death that night. After the ritual, I was sleeping in our sedan on the way home after fooling around with the Ouija board when I felt our car jerk. I woke up instantly. Looking out the window, I discovered that we had been hit by a huge oil tanker. I panicked and leaped out of the car. Luckily, my mom and I survived the crash since the front of the car was a total wreck. I still don't have an explanation as to why those things happened to us but I'm thankful that nothing else happened after that. I've never played or gotten near a Ouija board since. My brother and I were staying out at night at our grandparents' house, and now for context, her house is in the middle of the ghetto in Golf Manor. Anyway, me and my brother were watching TV and my grandma was at the store, and then suddenly my brother says, wanna go into the basement? Not trying to sound like a wuss, I agreed. This was the worst decision of the month. We go into the basement and it is creepy as hell, and when we reach the bottom of the staircase, the door shuts behind us. Now, I just shake it off as natural, but still, I feel uneasy. We go into the garage because her garage is in the basement, so we start going through. We find a rusty pipe and a motorcycle handlebar and some faint writing on the wall. We obviously find other things like a lawnmower and lawn stuff too. But then, we heard a loud bang, like the sound of a metal door slamming. It was the laundry room door. We almost crapped our pants, and we ran back upstairs, scared as hell. Later that night, we started to fall asleep. Grandma was already asleep. We heard what sounded like all the basement doors opening and slamming shut. Grandma, like I said, was not awake. 
We ended up finally falling asleep and told her about what happened the next morning. She just laughed and said, that's just Jim messing with you. And then she explained that Jim was the old house owner who had died there. That didn't really help us much, but it did ease our minds. So my boyfriend recently moved to the city and got this room in this student building. To explain, we have three different levels and each level is the same. It has four individual doors with individual locks. Each door is a separate room that you can rent. So you share shower, toilet, kitchen, but overall it's kind of like having your own place. More like an apartment than a house. He lives on the third floor and we recently bought a cabinet for his place. So, as we were lifting the cabinet through the front door, the guy also comes into the building with us. We politely let him pass because lifting the thing upstairs is going to take a lot of time. I smile at him and say hello, and then see his face. Legit, then, all my stranger danger alarms start going off. He had this weird smile, like a satisfied, smug kind of grin. He towered over me, and I saw his dirty mustache that barely even was a mustache. That kind of thing 14-year-olds grow. Nothing really is there yet, just here and there are some hairs. Also, his hair looked greasy, and he just looked dirty. I noticed he went to the second floor, lucky for us. Once we get to the stairs, we both agree that he creeped us out. But we try not to judge, and just let it go. Like a week or so later, we have a dog over. We go and walk him in the evening, and it was still light outside at this time. As we start to walk back to the building, we spot the creepy guy, and have to pass him because of the way he was walking. It was like he was moving in slow motion, not a care in the world, and again, with that satisfied, smug grin on his face. But that's not what creeped us out. Looking at his face, we realized that there was no way he was sober. He looked so out of this world, very noticeably on drugs. In that moment, the way he walked and the way he looked, I just got really wrong vibes from him. I did not want to be close to him at all, and again, my stranger danger alarms were going off. This happened near the city center. My boyfriend and I decide not to walk back with him to the building, so we take another route just to avoid him. And we take our time to make sure that he's in his room before we enter the building. This is the creepiest part. I'll have to give you some background information. Three weeks before our first encounter with this guy, someone randomly got murdered while he was jogging near the school campus. Stabbed. Died. Instantly. The suspect had been seen at the time near the campus, and so a drawing of said suspect had been released. But they didn't have him, and didn't really have anything else to work with. Now, just today, my boyfriend and I got back from his work at like 4 in the afternoon, when we noticed someone in a suit standing outside. Didn't really think much of it. Later that night, the guy who lives next door catches me as I just got back from the bathroom and asks me if we already have a key to the front door. I say, yeah, we do, why? He said that the police had to break the door down, so he was in charge of getting everyone new keys. My boyfriend at this time joins us with the person who lives on the other side of us. I ask what happened. Apparently, the guy who killed the person near the campus lived on the second floor. Legit, my hairs start standing up straight when I hear those words. I ask if he could have been seen, or how he looked. He told me he was tall, black hair with a weird mustache, and looks kind of dirty. It was the very same creepy dude. My boyfriend and I are still in utter shock that we lived so close to this murderer, someone who had walked around near the city center and cooked his dinner in the shared kitchen while he took someone's life. Someone that I had smiled to, said hello, and tried to avoid. So creepy murderer living in the same building? Let's not meet again.
Years ago, during a church event that I was forced to attend, we all had a terrifying experience. The setup was that boys slept anywhere they wanted to downstairs, and the girls were free to sleep wherever they wanted to upstairs. Some rooms were locked off, however, as the church was being renovated at the time. Anyway, it didn't matter too much, because we were just a small group. Night rolled around and us girls migrated into the nursery while most of the guys crashed in the indoor gym slash basketball court. Only one guy couldn't sleep. Above the basketball court are windows to another room that was locked off and the guy kept seeing flashing lights as well as the silhouettes of people looking at him. He didn't stay in the gym for very long. About the same time, myself and the other girls were still in the nursery. At that moment, we were playing apples to apples. The door was closed, and next to it was a one-way window. Inside was like a mirror. It was so that kids didn't see their parents coming to check on them and make a fuss. Well, I started hearing banging and scratching on the door. I freaked out and looked up to see two grinning faces staring back at all of us. Remember, we were on the mirror side of the one-way window. One of us bolted toward the door, and we heard stomping down the hall, but no one was there. The pastor came up screaming at us, saying that we were all just imagining things. We know what we saw, though, as well as heard, and all of us refuse to go back. This was one of the most frightening moments of my life. My best friend at the time, my brother, his friends, and my friend's boyfriend all went to our local abandoned house, which we call the Witch's Circle, to go ghost hunting. Now this little abandoned house is actually in a national park called Little Basin Creek Reservoir. But there's actually a story behind this house, which I don't know how much of it I believe. It's said that on Halloween night in the 50s, two guys brought their girlfriends out for a sacrifice. I've gone to the archives, done tons of research on this, and can't find anything to verify this information. This Halloween, when we went out there, we were clearly the only ones present. Our cars were the only vehicles there. You have to drive right past town a little ways and head out a dirt road to get there and there's only one spot for parking, so we would be able to see if any others were there. As we start making our walk down the trail to the house, I'm holding my best friend's hand. We walked under a tree while the entire time I'm staring at the house and not paying attention to my surroundings like I should be in a dark wooded area. A small branch from the tree that we're all walking under at the time falls and lands horizontally at my feet. I didn't see this happen, but my friend and my brother did. They stopped me to look before stepping over the severed branch. I should have taken its warning and not kept going, but I did. As we got further along and closer to the house, now it's not a super long walk to the house, maybe 120 feet from the entrance, we all stood talking quietly amongst ourselves, and then we all heard a very high-pitched scream coming from the backyard. We stopped in our tracks, and I ran back towards the cars. I've never been more terrified. Ever. It's a sound that I will never be able to erase from my memory. That high-pitched death shriek. There's no way I can debunk this, as we were the only ones out there and it definitely wasn't the sound of an animal. Especially because it sounded like a human female. I haven't been back there since. Ten years ago, when I was 14, myself, my cousin, and a friend all had what I can only describe as a demonic experience on Halloween. I wanted to see if anyone else has had anything similar happen or knows what this could have been. So, Halloween ten years ago, the three of us decided it would be scary to walk through the woods nearby where I lived. I knew my way around well, as I had grown up going there. 
We were all walking along chatting as we approached the middle of the woods. By a hollowed out tree, I see a yellowish glow. I stopped where I was and my cousin and friend also stopped. I just stared at this glow as it got brighter, and they did too. We all glanced at each other with a WTF look on our faces. I'm literally thinking I'm imagining things or something like that, but they both confirmed that they were seeing the same exact thing that I was. In the glow, a young girl appeared. She looked to be about eight years old and appeared to be dressed in Victorian era style clothing and had pigtails hanging down on either side of her face. She started off looking quite washed out in color and kind of transparent. She became more of a solid looking shape and the glow got brighter. As we're watching this, we're all whispering and confirming that we are indeed seeing it. As the glow in the girl became more prominent, I went from feeling normal and in disbelief to feeling uneasy, then fear and dread, then finally like we needed to get out of there and that our lives were possibly in danger. I can put into words all the feelings I felt, but none of them are good enough and I've never felt anything like it. I could tell my cousin and friend felt it too. The glowing thing then moved closer to us. There were no footsteps, no sounds, no nothing. It then looked and felt as if it were dashing at us and it was literally so close in front of us, I shouted, run. We all grabbed hands and sprinted past it toward the main road where there was lots of light. We stopped briefly as we turned and couldn't see anything. And then suddenly it was there again. It was fast and we could all see this glowing person-like shape rushing toward us. Again, we ran as fast as we could until we could see the main road. I glanced behind and it wasn't far away at all. I grabbed my cousin and friends again and started pulling them down the steep hill as the main road was at the bottom of it. We stumbled and half fell down this hill, but all managed to keep getting to our feet. I'm sure this was down to pure terror and adrenaline. We got onto the path by the main road and looked up at the woods and the glow was there, clear as day, at the top of it. It wasn't coming toward us at all anymore. We caught our breath and were ranting about it to each other, all confirming again that we had actually seen and felt what we did. The glow was still at the top of the hill. It was as if there was an invisible boundary that it couldn't cross. We turned away from the woods, and when we looked back, it had moved behind a tree. It was almost as if it stood there watching us, trying to hide. We stood at the bottom of the hill, by the main road, looking at it for about 30 minutes, maybe longer. Eventually it was gone, and I saw a slight glow in the distance of the woods, followed by nothing. We returned about a week later because we all knew what we had seen, but we wanted to check to make sure that there was no possible light that could be shining there. It was literally pitch black. No light was visible and we retracted our exact steps. I am a sensitive. I have seen and experienced the paranormal since I was little. My experiences range from surprising to scary and can happen anytime. I don't control it. The one thing I can count on though is something almost always happens to me around Halloween. I'm sure most people know that Halloween is the time when the veil between the worlds is thinnest. It's not just that day. Sometimes as much as two weeks, before and after Halloween, the veil is thin enough to severely affect sensitive people like myself. I have a few sensitive friends and know that some can even feel the veil as it thins. Responses to the veil range depending on sensitivity. I have experienced lucid dreaming, vivid dreams, and severe anxiety. I do have anxiety, which I have medication for. Last Halloween, I had a panic attack come out of nowhere. I was shaking and could hardly breathe for no reason. I barely made it back to the car, and I know that it was because of the veil. I don't usually have those attacks since starting my medicine, and I went back to the same mall a few months later and experienced no anxiety. 
I don't remember everything that happens on Halloween, so the experiences I do remember are usually among the scariest. I'll start with the ones that happened the longest time ago. That Halloween I had a few things happen to me, as expected. I can't remember them, since they didn't really stand out. This experience was more creepy than scary. It was either Halloween night or just after. I couldn't sleep, so I was playing on my phone in the dark. I decided it was time to make myself sleep, so I put my phone down. When I did, I saw a dark, cat-sized shadow jump at my face. I jerked back, thinking that my black cat had jumped up on my bed. I never felt her land on the bed, though. I looked around for her just to realize that she was asleep on the other side of my bed. She would have had to climb over me to lay there from that angle. It took me a while to get to sleep that night. The next one is my sister's experience. It happened either that same year or a little after that. She isn't as sensitive as I am, so her experiences are fewer but stand out more. She was riding home with her boyfriend from the Halloween gathering that they had gone to. It was dark, of course. When he pulled into the driveway to their house, she said that the lights landed on something large that was running on all fours. It was humanoid shaped. He didn't see it. She told me about it, and I told her it was fine. She was inside, and I told her not to go outside again that night. Last Halloween was my most active one. It was about a week or so before it when I had my panic attack. I also had several lucid dreams, and one very vivid dream that I still cannot convince myself it was just a dream. I also saw much more than ghosts. I have a job that requires me to go to customers' houses to try and make contact with them. That was what I was doing when two of these incidents occurred. I can't remember if they happened on the same night or not, but it was just before Halloween. I was on dimly lit back roads in my small town. In my town, most of the back roads are dark, so I was lucky to have some extra light. I rounded a curve and my lights lit up something standing on the other side of a fence. It was a gray mass that seemed almost two-dimensional. The best way to describe it would be almost like the reports of Bigfoot. It was taller than a human, but shaped similarly. It was not Bigfoot, though. It had no definition to it. I believe it belonged to a different place. I drove faster after seeing it, and took a different road back. The next thing that I saw was very similar to the previous creature, except that it flew. I was in my own car. With the way the windshield slants, I only saw it for a moment. It was almost like a pterodactyl, but it was gray and had no definition, just like the other one. I describe it that way for lack of a better way of describing it. Obviously, I don't think we have extinct flying dinosaurs in my small town in Tennessee. These two creatures sound absurd, I know, and even I would have a hard time believing someone if they described them to me. My last experience of that Halloween was the most terrifying experience that I have ever had around Halloween. I was pulling into my driveway at night after getting off work. It was late, and everyone else would have gone to bed by then. It was the first time I had seen something like it, and hopefully the last. I understand why my sister was freaked out that time. A large, humanoid creature on all fours was running through the yard. I only saw it for a few seconds, but it was close. It was big. Maybe twice the size of our chocolate lab. Once we passed each other, I didn't see it again. Needless to say, I made a mad dash into the house and wouldn't let the dogs out to use the bathroom. I'm a logical person and I do consider myself a skeptic even though I know what I saw and I know that it really happened. Maybe it's just that I tend to be skeptical about most things. I will as briefly as I can describe a little history of the house and the changes my family made to it, because I believe that it applies to what I experienced. I'm originally from a small farming town in Washington State. 
My parents bought a ranch-style house in this town in the early 1980s, and we lived there until early 1993. The house was built in the mid-1950s, and was known as a party house in the 1970s when my parents were in high school. My parents did a lot of work on the house, as it was a little run down when they bought it. There were many holes punched in the walls and doors. The original hardwood floors were in rough shape, and the family room and original master bedroom had disgusting, torn, brown, and lime green shag carpeting. The original master bedroom also had wood paneling on the walls. We tore out all the paneling and replaced the horrifying shag carpets with vinyl and new carpeting and renovated the bathrooms. The main change that my parents did to the house was they added a new master bedroom to the back of the house and converted the old master bedroom to a large laundry room slash sewing and crafts room for my mom. The new master bedroom was added onto the other side of the master bedroom from the original master bedroom turned laundry room. I include all of this because during college, I mentioned what happened in this house to a friend of mine who was really into the paranormal, and he suggested that the renovations my parents did, in combination with it being a former party house where there had been drug use and possibly violence, had stirred something up. So one side of the house was set up as follows, from front to back. Family room, the new laundry room, the master bathroom, then the new master bedroom at the back. The kitchen was to the right of the family room if you were facing the door to the laundry room and could be partially seen from the family room. Now to my experiences. The Void Man. I do not know how old I was when I first saw it or how old I was when I last saw it. I lived in the house until just before my eighth birthday. I was between five and seven. That much I do know. I mostly saw it when I was in the family room. It would stand perfectly still in the doorway from the family room to the laundry room. It seemed to be staring at me, but it had no eyes. It was a pitch black void in the shape of a human. There were no discernible facial or other body features on it. It was a body with a head on top. The outline of the body appeared to be slightly fuzzy or misty. I would say it was over six feet tall. I should also mention that no one who lived in the house was that tall. My mom was maybe 5'3", my dad is 5'7", and my brother was a toddler at this time, so it couldn't be me misremembering any of them. I would just stand there and stare back at it. I felt frozen and didn't know what to do or say. I felt like I couldn't speak if I wanted to when it was there. I remember feeling a sinking sensation when I saw it. I have one distinct memory of staring at it in the doorway to the laundry room, and I could see my mom working in the kitchen. She was standing at the stove and could have seen it if she had turned her head to her right. She did not notice it. I named it the Void Man at some point. Staring at it was like staring into a deep void. A void that would swallow me up. I don't remember feeling fear exactly when I saw the full shadow person. It was more that I couldn't feel anything. That was not the case for the other way that I would see it. It would like to peek its head around the door frames at me. It would do it several times in rapid succession. That would terrify me. I think that was its intention. I would usually go running off to my room or to go find my mom. I only ever saw the full body of the void man from the family room looking into the laundry room, but it would peek its head out at me from both of the laundry room doors, the one leading into the family room and the one leading into the master bathroom. If my parents ever saw anything, they had never mentioned it, and I have never mentioned it to them. I'm sure that there are those out there that will say, well, you were very young, you must be remembering wrong, or you made it up at some point and then it became real to you over time. I wish this was the case. I really do. But I remember the Void Man very vividly. I know that I saw this thing, whatever it was. We moved out of that house in 1993 and moved into one that we had built. I have never seen anything like what I did in that house ever again, but the experience has followed me my entire life. I have a nervousness about open doors. 
and what I might see on the other side. Since the pandemic, the church my parents attend has been recording their Sunday morning worship earlier in the week, and then the minister will edit and publish it on social media on the actual service day. This past Wednesday, we recorded the worship music. I'm one of the three singers that we have, and my mom is the pianist. While in the middle of recording our first song, we all hear a man yell, Stop! I look over in the direction that it came from, somewhere off stage to my left see nothing, and then we just finish up the song. After we finish the song, one of the other singers goes, Did you hear that? All five of us, including our other instrumentalist, my mom, and the three singers, all said yes. The saxophone player was suggesting that it was a wrong note that we had played, or possibly a weird squeak as the building settled. None of us were really convinced, though. Fast forward to this Sunday. My mom and I watched the service and realized that the noise couldn't have been from the sax because the sax has a microphone and would have been very audible on the video. We noticed where the two of us looked over at the noise and we even replayed that section a couple of times with the volume raised. Both of us could hear it, just barely, beneath the sound of the music. This was by far the freakiest thing that I have ever experienced in that church, and none of us will ever be finding ourselves alone in that building again. When I was about 12, I'm now 23. I lived in a relatively large, run-down house. I don't know much about its history, but I do know that it was built in 1936 based off of a newspaper that my family found in one of the walls during a renovation. I believe it had about 17 separate rooms, a fact that I was obsessed with when I first moved in. I just liked counting things. These rooms included two basements. One was right near the garage with an old door that went down to a concrete cellar where you could access some of the ducts to the house. And there was one within the house that held the laundry room and a storage room. My bedroom and the bedroom adjacent to mine both had crawl spaces going into the walls, two of which I covered with dressers. The house often gave me a sense of unease because of the sounds that it made due to it being old, combined with the fact that we couldn't afford heating it all winter, so there were blankets and plastic wrap in all of the windows constantly making it very dark. Being alone in it was just scary for some reason. I could never shake the feeling of something looking over my shoulder when I was there alone, especially causing me to act like a fool and yell out at nothing while home alone sometimes. Honestly, I'm not sure what caused that, but I'm sure that it had to do with the level of darkness within the house due to there being no natural lighting and my tiny adolescent brain conjuring up demons just because the house had been settling or something of that sort. One day, I was heading downstairs to do the laundry, and after I was done switching everything over and grabbing the laundry basket, my attention got caught by a large tank of some sort on one of the outer walls of the laundry room. I'm not sure what it held. It wasn't a water heater, but it may have been some sort of reservoir back in the day. It was very, very dusty, since no one ever went near it or touched it at all. Covering the tank this time were dozens of handprints, small to large, and also ones with much longer fingers than a normal hand. I'm not sure if it was due to dragging down, or the hands were just like that. It sent me into fight or flight immediately. I sprinted up the stairs and stayed up there for the rest of the day. It really bothered me trying to think of what could have caused the unnatural-looking, long-fingered handprints. I scared myself a lot thinking about it. Recently, I moved into a new apartment, and in the garage there are a few black handprints that I don't remember being there when we moved in. This could just be because I never noticed them, but I swear they were never there, and one day recently, they had just appeared. It brought back my memory of my old house and the fingerprints in the dust, hence my post here. It makes me a little uneasy, but not much else can be done about it, I'm sure. 
This event has stayed with me through the years, and I thought I would share it to see what others outside of my perspective think. I'm not really sure, though I have had many more experiences to do with that house in the following years of my life. I'm a single mother of five adult sons. When they were teenagers, we lived in a century home. Beautiful and large, with plenty of room for my brood. I should mention, our house was the house that all their friends congregated to. There were rarely nights on weekends and summers that we had less than six occupants. I tell you this to try and make you understand that these stories I'm about to tell are the truth and are corroborated by many people. When we first moved in, everything was nice and quiet for a number of months. Then slowly, activity progressed. My sons and I were all having unexplained happenings. They didn't tell me for almost a year because they didn't want to scare me. My first experience was being woken up at around 3 a.m. At first, I was in a half-wake, half-sleep mode. What woke me was a very loud noise coming from upstairs. It sounded like the boys were rearranging furniture, very heavy furniture. Loud scraping, so loud that I was sure they were scratching the wood floors. I instantly became furious and marched upstairs ready to bust some butts. When I got to the top of the stairs, all was quiet and dark. I started opening bedroom doors only to find all the boys sleeping soundly. I thought, wow, that was a vivid dream. To my chagrin, it happened a couple of months later, and became more and more frequent until it was almost a weekly event. I was speaking about this with my neighbor and she got a funny look on her face. I asked her what was wrong. She said, I don't want to scare you, but when my sister, who's clairvoyant, was over, she looked up at that window, pointing to one of the boys' rooms, and said, she has company. I asked her what she saw, and she said she saw a man and a woman in old-timey clothes looking back at her. At some point, I decided I wanted to share my experiences with my sons. When I did, they all broke out with their own stories. Some of them had been touched, some just heard noises or felt their beds being shaken. Here are a few more memorable ones in my mind. We, we being myself and seven or eight teenagers filling up every square inch of the place, were all just visiting and half-watching Family Guy. My youngest decided he was tired and wanted to go up to bed. Away he went, only to return a short time later with pale skin and wide eyes. He said that he had closed his bedroom door and gotten into the top bunk. That's when he heard the door handle turn, heard the door open and shut again, and then felt someone sit on the bottom bunk. He figured it was his brother, and leaned over the bunk and yelled something trying to scare him. He said he froze because there was no one there. He was completely alone, hence the wide eyes and pale skin. He truly looked like he'd seen a ghost. One morning, I woke up to find my boys and one of their friends sleeping everywhere in the living room, which was not allowed in our house. I woke up my second eldest and asked what the deal was. He said they couldn't sleep upstairs because something was opening and closing all the doors all night. He said they'd wake up and prop things in front of the doors to keep them from slamming, only to be awoken up again by the same slamming sound. He said, Ma, those ghosts keep moving the stuff we put in front of the doors. We decided to sleep down here. I couldn't blame them. There are so many stories, but I'll just tell one more. My oldest subsequently joined the Marine Corps, and on his month-long furlough, after his Iraq tour, he had a very creepy encounter. He said he was laying on his stomach and reading from his laptop when he felt something sit on the bed. He said he looked over and saw the indention of a person sitting there and said out loud, F ghosts. A second later, he said he was being pushed into the bed. He spoke in the name of Jesus and it got off of him. My final straw was on Halloween night. I was at the computer in the dining room, home alone. I felt something behind me. 
I turned and heard my name being said in an awful and sinister voice, and then the sound of something large falling down my staircase. It was so loud that I thought I'd find a broken dresser at the bottom, but nothing was there. I searched upstairs and outside for the cause of the crash, but nothing. I had my pastors and the elders of my church come bless my property and my home. There's been no strange activity since that day. I no longer live in that house, but one of my sons bought it. The house is still clean. I was a sergeant in the U.S. Army and getting out from the military when President Bush ordered more troops into Iraq in 2003. I had just returned home into Austin, Texas when I was called into my local National Guard unit at Camp Mabry and told that I was being recalled to the Army, but the unit was already tasked out to deploy to Iraq. I was not part of their unit yet, so the commander offered to give me a waiver to deploy with a government contractor, Halliburton, in Houston. I knew that I would make more money as a contractor, so I took the offer. Not long after arriving in Kuwait at Camp Doha, I began working with the operations team overseeing logistics affairs. We would oversee the daily convoy of supply between Kuwait and Baghdad, a route riddled with IED incidents, small arms skirmishes, and almost constant breakdowns of army and civilian vehicles. Because I was an SAW gunner in the 1st Infantry Division while in active duty and was technically still in the guard, I was often in the convoys manning a mounted weapon that accompanied the mostly civilian convoys. During these runs, we had a few strange encounters in an area south of Baghdad, known then as Camp Babylon. Occupied by French troops, but then designated an archaeological site for obvious reasons, Camp Babylon was set up in the area that was said to be originally inhabited by the famous Tower of Babel. Indeed, there were ruins there that did look like a massive structure once stood at that spot. I had two strange incidents happen to me while passing through there. The first incident seems to be a bit benign, but sets the mood for the second. We were passing through Camp Babylon in the afternoon one day when our convoy took small arms fire. The SOP at the time, standard operating procedure, was to stop the convoy and return fire. This was because in the past, such incidents ended up being a long gunman attempting to scare the convoy into running into IEDs on the road. Because of this, the standard operating procedure changed to stop the convoy, dismount, and return fire. While engineers looked for explosive devices on the road, we scanned the horizon for enemies. Nothing. They most likely fled immediately. However, the ruins around Camp Babylon were alive with shadow figures that seemed to move about the area. Several times we would spot the figures, but they would instantly disappear. A contractor lying beside me with his weapon commented, how odd that we were in the shadow of Babel and fighting the supernatural. I didn't respond, but knew that he was a 32nd degree mason who was really into the arcane aspects of Babylon, etc. I didn't feel at the time that much was supernatural, but certainly did see the shadowy and bizarrely small figures dart about the structures. Once the road was deemed clear, we continued on to Baghdad. The second incident occurred about a month later. At this point, the weather in southern Iraq and Kuwait had turned quite cold at night. During this encounter, we had just completed the supply run to Baghdad and were returning back to Camp Doha in Kuwait when a vehicle in our convoy broke down. Once again, we found ourselves right at Camp Babylon. While the army mechanics took a look at the vehicle and the rest of us took up fighting positions around the area, strange things began to occur. It started with a strange light bobbing in the desert. Thinking it was a person with a flashlight, we used night vision goggles to watch. It was simply a glowing ball of light moving toward a set of ruins. After initial contact with the light, a few of us had moved forward away from the convoy to see what the source was. After seeing it was self-contained and not a person, we were a bit alarmed. Then we all heard a sound that I will never forget. 
A long wailing began from one of the ruined structures and foundations not far away. It sounded like a woman in agony mixed with loneliness. On and on the sounds went while we huddled in the cold and dark, wondering what the hell we were listening to. With our night vision goggles equipped, we used our flashlights to spot the ruins. If you've ever done this, you'll know that a normal flashlight with NVGs looks like a massive beam of light. We scoured the area, but no source of the whales or the ball of light were seen. About this time, we were told via radio that the vehicle was repaired and ready to roll, so we decided to return to the convoy. I was slinging my SAW over my shoulder when I noticed my contractor partner was staring at the ruins in horror. He was frozen. I shook him and he snapped out of his stupor, quickly leaving the area with the rest of us. Once we were back at the camp and it was pleasantly daylight the following morning, several of us were chatting about the encounter at Camp Babylon before our daily operations briefing. It was then that I remembered the terrified expression on the face of the contractor, so I asked him about it. He was still obviously traumatized by the event, but managed to explain that as we were leaving our position on the sandy hill, he saw a tall, black figure standing beside the ruins. It was watching us as we were looking for it. He said that he felt an instant wave of despair hit him and thought that he was going to die. He didn't even remember leaving the area. His next memory was in the Humvee, headed back to Kuwait. I now write non-fiction books about haunted places for Llewellyn Publishing and have visited hundreds of reputedly haunted spots but I'll never forget the wailing figure at the ruins of Babel. It's also worth noting that when I related this story to some of our Pakistani employees at Camp Doha, they were also quite terrified. One of them, a translator we called Ardi, said that we had encountered a jinn, or a damned spirit, and that we were lucky to be able to tell the tale. I agree. In the early 2000s, when I was four or five years old, my parents had just gotten through divorce and my mom started dating this guy. He would come over to our house regularly. Things didn't seem that bad at first, but he actually drank daily. This was something I didn't understand yet at my age, but yeah. So this guy wasn't all that bad with my sister, who was two or three at the time, but he took some sadistic interest in hurting me. He would arrive at our house almost every day, and the first thing he would do was take off his belt and start beating me with it. This got to the point where I would hide if I knew he was coming. As for why my mother didn't leave him then, he threatened to kill us if she did. Now, this one incident is burned into my memory. On one random day, he had found a nice little cardboard box. He picked me up and shoved me into said box and sat on top of it. My mother was doing the dishes, and I assumed she couldn't hear me screaming for her as I peered out of the box's handle hole at her back, before he covered the holes with his hands. I screamed for a good few minutes as this asshole just laughed about torturing me. The only reason he got off the box was that I had a small screwdriver in my pocket that I used to stab him right in his ass cheek. This got him to fly up off the box and pissed him off because he wasn't having fun anymore. He picked me up again and carried me off to my room where he proceeded to beat me with his belt. Then he left me in my room after taking my lamp and locked my door. I was afraid of the dark, so I cried and screamed some more. I did so until he finally left, and my mother came and opened my door again. The random beatings would go on until he eventually got in trouble for something and ended up going to jail. Sometimes I think maybe my mother called the police on him. He called my mom from jail and told her that if she found anyone else, that he would kill her, me, and my younger sister. We ended up moving three cities over, and as far as I know, my mom never heard from him again. 
This guy is almost single-handedly responsible for several of my long-term phobias. And as an adult now, I'd kick his ass if I saw him again. I'm 90% sure that the church I work at is haunted. I work in the church nursery, to be specific, which is part of the original church, which was built in the early 50s. They now have a detached main building for the adults, and my building is the youth and nursery building. The church also owns a house right next door that was built in the 60s, maybe the 70s, which the youth leader gets to live in. I've been working in the nursery alone for almost four years now. I also babysit the kids of the youth pastor in their house next door. At the nursery, we have mainly very old toys made in the 70s that somehow still manage to work. I've never even replaced the batteries in these toys. After Sunday school, everyone in my building except me and my kids move over to the service building so the kids and I are completely alone. I only have two kids at a time since we are a very small church. Without fail, at 11 a.m. every Sunday when youth leaves the building, I will have the same three toys randomly start making noises. I know the kids aren't the ones making them go off, since at 11 we have snack time so we're all at the table. At first I thought I was crazy, as it would only ever happen while I was alone with the kids. Until last year, that is. Last year we got a new pastor and his wife decided that she was going to work in the nursery with me since the youth pastor had a newborn. We wanted extra help just in case we had a situation go down that required two people. Well, the toys began going off with her present as well. She didn't seem to think anything of it. Once the pandemic started, she no longer works with me and I'm alone watching just one toddler. When it's just us, I'll hear talking, footsteps, and doors opening or closing. I don't normally feel any bad vibes coming from whatever is in the church, though, so I leave it be. Now let's talk about the house next door that the church owns. This house, I actually am slightly scared of. Things are always falling and breaking in that house. The first thing that comes to mind is two years ago. The kids and I were in the living room playing, and all of a sudden we heard the sound of glass breaking. We searched the house and found that all of the light bulbs in the bathroom were shattered. I freaked out to say the least, but apparently stuff like that happens all the time over there. Another time, I was changing the baby's diaper in his room. He has sliding doors on his closet. He was fussy, so I was singing to him when all of a sudden I was hit from behind. His closet door somehow fell on me. I put his door back up and into the brackets, and maybe an hour later we went back to his room to get his shoes so we could go play outside. As we were making our way past the closet door whilst leaving, the door nearly fell on the baby. Thankfully my reflexes were quick enough that it landed against my arm instead, bruising me pretty good. I told his parents and got a very nonchalant, huh, weird. Then comes to last night. I was bathing my four-year-old son, along with a one-year-old, while everyone else was next door at the church. All of a sudden, a canvas picture frame fell off the wall in the hallways closest to the bathroom. I'm pretty freaked out. I fixed the picture and got the kids out of the bath. As I was trying to get the one-year-old ready for bed, he wouldn't stop shaking, crying, and looking into the corner of his room by his closet. He was absolutely terrified. I have never seen this baby so frightened. He's usually really very happy all the time. We immediately left the room, left the light on, and went into the living room with one of the other kids. I told his parents again, and they just said, yeah, it happens sometimes. I'm starting to get worried, and I'm afraid to go to work. I work either at the church or at their house at least four days a week, sometimes more. I'm starting to no longer feel safe.
So for a little background info, I'm a 34 year old female. My husband is a 35 year old male and our two daughters are nine and 10. We moved into a house built in 1900 back in October of 2014. The following year in 2015, I had quit my job to stay home with my youngest, then four, and to be available for school runs for my then five year old who had just started kindergarten. Fast forward about a month into the school year of October 2015. One day after I dropped my kindergartner off at school, I took my youngest for a walk through a very old cemetery around the corner from our house. The cemetery is closed to new graves. Many of the tombstones date back to the late 1700s into the 1800s. The autumn foliage was beautiful. I even took a few pictures. My daughter had never been in a cemetery before and was on cloud nine. She's weird and morbid like me. She was running around inspecting the graves, asking a million questions, and as she sometimes does, she informed me about some of the history about specific graves and the people who were buried. She has a tendency to make up stories about things that she sees that have happened that turn out to be facts later on. I'm not claiming that she's psychic, but she definitely has my bloodline in her. We went home and within a couple of days, weird things started happening. It started out small, like I would feel as if someone had brushed by me walking or something like that, but no one was there. Whenever I was in the basement doing laundry, I started feeling like someone was watching me. Then I started thinking I heard whispers or commotion coming from areas of the house where no one was at. I was also going through a bit of severe depression at the time, so at first I thought I was just going crazy. Then, one evening, I was sitting on the couch with my husband watching TV, and in the corner of the room we both saw and heard something dark and shadowy fall from the ceiling and slam on the floor. I jumped, he jumped. We both looked at each other, and he got up to check and see what it was. But once again, like all the other incidents so far, nothing was there. It was at that time that I confided in him about the brushes, whispers, and commotion. He then informed me that he had heard things too. Like, he would be upstairs in the shower and thought he heard me come home with the kids, the front door open and then talking, only to find out that no one was home when he came downstairs. He just didn't think anything of it, so he never said anything. At this point I realized that it wasn't in my head and that our house was likely haunted. It is what it is. Then, a few nights later, I woke up suddenly in the middle of the night, maybe around 3 a.m. I got up because I felt wide awake. So I left my room and went out to the hallway when I suddenly noticed my youngest daughter on the first landing going down the stairs. I called out to her, what are you doing, baby? She looked up at me with the most frightened face I have ever seen and she said, I heard you calling me downstairs. Chills ran through my entire body and I told her, okay, well, I'm right here. Why don't you come sleep in the bed with me? She ran back up the stairs. The next morning after I dropped my oldest off at school, I called my mom. She's, well, I don't know how to put it exactly, but basically a modern day witch and also familiar with hauntings and such. So she tells me what I need to do and to come over and get supplies. The whole thing basically consisted of putting crystals behind all the doors in the house, spreading Himalayan salt across doorways, going outside, and also spreading the salt around each corner of the house and blessing it. And then finally, saging the entire house. I'm very familiar with saging, as I've done it before. Everything is going fine until the saging comes. I get a fire-safe ashtray fill it up with dried sage, light it, and begin the process starting from the upstairs, working my way down. My youngest is with me during this process. I get through the whole house and down to the basement when suddenly the ashtray explodes in my hand. Literally, it exploded. It freaked me out and my daughter. I send her upstairs and I clean up the mess. Meanwhile, the entire time, I feel like someone is watching me. At that point, I immediately called my mom and told her what had happened. She then decided that she would come over and resage the house. We got to talking and trying to figure out what was going on, what caused this sudden haunting after a year of living there. We came to the conclusion that it was likely many factors. 
The veil is, after all, its thinnest during the month of October, Samhain, which basically means the connection to our world and the supernatural grows stronger during this time. I've always been susceptible to the supernatural since childhood. That's another story. And my depression likely brought out anything that was laying dormant. And that my youngest daughter possibly brought something back with her from our cemetery trip just before all this started happening or awakened something when she was there. After that, everything calmed down and basically went back to normal. On Halloween that year, just a few days after the saging and whatnot, we were with a group trick-or-treating and my friend told me to tell everyone about what was going on. The mass consensus was that we should burn the house to the ground, but that was of course just a joke. We did not, and virtually nothing has happened since. I was around 12 years old and me and my friend were in the mountains. I can't recall the name of the village, but it was situated in the Czech Republic. We were on a hike and stumbled upon an old military station or bunker, just left there after World War II. We went home for flashlights and came back just before the sun was out. We went inside and found that it had like two or three floors underground, maybe more with a 40 meter well full of frozen water on the ground floor. We decided to go down and explore. First floor, there was nothing unusual, just some empty concrete spaces. We went another floor down and I saw some things on the ground that looked like dead rats from a distance. I laughed it off and went to take a closer look. They were bats, about 10 of them, just lying down, dead. They weren't like violently smashed or anything. There was no blood. It was as if they were just sleeping, not even rotten or decaying. I poked one with my foot and the thing just rolled over. I started to get a little scared, but eager to explore further. My friend was basically halfway up the stairs at this point, nervous laughing, saying, yeah, we should really go, I have a bad feeling or something like that. I was almost pulled to continue exploring. Half of me knew that it didn't feel right, but I ignored my friend and continued on. I was almost there and I suddenly got sick in my gut. That feeling that's screaming in you, the adrenaline. I took another couple of stairs, shining with my flashlight ahead, and then I saw it. I scanned the whole floor, seeing the stairs that went even further below collapsed so no getting further down, and as I looked across the room with my flashlight, there was a spot that it could not illuminate. In the middle of that spot, there stood the shadow of a man. The flashlight's beam just couldn't get through the form of it. It ate all of the light. I then realized how cold that it had become. I could see my breath. I was staring, paralyzed, for what seems like minutes, but was probably only a couple of seconds. The shadow got a little closer as I blinked. No need to say, I bolted like I never did before, not even caring if it was behind me or what it was. Just running for my life. I got to the entrance and my friend was looking at me, horrified, and I just told him to run while rushing past him. We sprinted for about five minutes then confirmed that yes, we were still alive. When we got home, he told me that he had seen something in the corner as I ran past him, so it wasn't just me. His father told us the next day that a lot of soldiers had died there, and there's even an army museum nearby. So was it the ghost of a soldier or a shadow person? I am a female in her early 20s. I live in the US in a desert state, a town in the middle of nowhere. I come from a military family, generations of Air Force and Army, and a grandfather who is involved in Project Blue Book. I was sitting alone in my house, playing some Gwent on PS4, when my little sister and her friend came rushing through the door. I jumped out of my skin. It was midnight, and no lights were on. 
My sister, let's call her Yellow and her friend Brown, seemed a bit shaken and nervous, though she and her friend were laughing as if they were up to no good. I asked them what they were doing, and Yellow said, we were out for a walk in the desert near the mountain. Keep in mind, my sister is 16. No reason for her and her 15-year-old friend to be out in the desert in the middle of the night. I was upset, but saw they were fine, so I shook it off. What did you guys do? Yellow and her friend looked at each other and went quiet. Her friend whispered, do we tell her? And Yellow replied, nah, she won't believe us. And they walked into the kitchen without a further word. Needless to say, I wanted to know what was going on, so I followed and promptly asked, Yellow, what's up? Don't make me go nuclear. Going nuclear was our code for telling mom. Yellow just looked at me and said, fine, just don't call me crazy. I nodded in agreement. I was intrigued, though I was expecting a lie from my known liar of a sister. Me and Brown saw a bunch of weird, large tents, and they were occupied. She sounded excited, yet a bit scared. I didn't think much of it at first. I mean, people like to camp, right? But I will admit, the area she described didn't sound like a good place to camp. Coyotes and snakes everywhere. So you saw some people camping, what of it? Brown shook her head and calmly said, Not camping tents. Big, big tents. Not a single vehicle parked nearby. I was now confused, and started to think that it was a lie. Who would go that far out near the mountains, set up huge tents, then drive away? I thought you said there were people there? I asked. We saw one person walking around the camp, circling it slowly, Yellow replied. Then Brown's face went pale and annoyed before she spoke. Yeah, then Yellow did something stupid and shouted at the camp. I quickly looked at Yellow, who looked guilty but simply laughed it off. All I did was say, hey, nice tent. No big deal. Brown shook her head. Yeah, but then the guy stopped and slowly turned to where we were. She went quiet and they both started to visibly get creeped out. And? I asked, starting to get a creepy vibe as well. I kid you not, Blue. This guy had no eyes or a nose. Just a big, crooked smile. Brown shuddered, and then said that this was the moment when they ran without a thought, hearing a coyote howling constantly as they ran, as if the animal was directly behind them. I told them not to go near there again, and they went about their night. Like I said, Yellow is a known liar, but Brown is not. Brown is the exact opposite of Yellow, honor student, religious, and not a bad bone in her body. She would even rat on Yellow whenever she tried lying around her. To be honest, if Brown wasn't with Yellow when this happened, I wouldn't have believed it. That night I swore I saw the same SUV drive by our house every single hour until the sun came up. After that night, things started getting weird in this town. About three days later, the house across from us echoed a blood-curdling scream, and it didn't sound human at all. Then there was a gunshot, and if it wasn't for the neighbors also hearing it, I would have thought I dreamt it. The thing is, multiple people heard the noises, and multiple times the police were called. No one showed. The next morning, the lady who lived in the house started moving her stuff into her van, but her boyfriend was nowhere in sight, which I thought was strange because those two were inseparable. They were the perfect college couple, plus they had just moved in. I talked to my neighbor about it while she was loading everything and he told me that he had called the cops when he heard the gunshot and what he told me freaked me out. Here's the conversation that he had with the 911 operator. Operator, police will be there in no more than five minutes, sir. Neighbor, thank you, operator, hangs up abruptly. Twelve minutes pass. He sees zero police in our area or at the house. Calls again. Operator. 911, what is the emergency? Neighbor. Yeah, I just called a uh, gunshot and scream. I was told five minutes, and no one is here. The operator was silent. My neighbor said, hello? Operator. Yes, sir. I have officers pulling into your area in two minutes. Neighbor. Okay, I'm gonna stay on the... Hangs up again. Line. 
Fifteen minutes later and still no police. He calls again. Operator. 911, what's your emergency? Neighbor. Yeah, it's me again. Where are the officers? Someone might be in danger. Operator. Sir, calm down. What is your address? Neighbor. I have given it each time I've called, but fine. Gives address again. Operator. Sir, the police are there and have been for 20 minutes now. Neighbor. Uh, no. I'm looking at the road and all the houses. No cops. Operator. Sir, stop prank calling. Hangs up. Now I thought that was just bizarre and unsettling thinking about our lack of police. But just as he finished with the story, a car pulls in and slowly heads to the house. It was the same SUV that I saw, and not only that, but it was a police SUV. It didn't even stop. It just slowed down by each house and then slowly drove by the college girl loading her stuff up. She froze and stared at the cop car and only continued when it left. I had enough, so I went over to ask if she needed any help loading things into her car, and she said yes. I started putting boxes in from the garage. I saw a poster of Sauron in one of the boxes, so we started talking about our shared love and obsession for Lord of the Rings. Then I asked where her boyfriend was, and she said, gone, without hesitation. I didn't push it. Once I had the last box in, I asked her if she had any more inside. She quickly jumped between me and the door inside and said, No, thank you, but that's all I have. I smiled and said, No worries, glad to be of help. I forced a calm, relaxed expression when I saw that her garage door leading inside was DIY locked from the outside. She got into her car and stared ahead and all she said to me was, Don't trust the police, don't trust the TV, and don't trust the animals. I felt a shiver run up my spine and quietly asked, what do you mean? She started her car and simply said, stay away from the mountain. She drove away and closed the garage as she went. I walked back to my house and even as I write this, no one comes in or out of that house. In between then and last night, our neighborhood has been infested with coyotes, though not a single one has been seen. Strange police behavior, a strange accumulation of crows and helicopters that only ever come by at night, circling my neighborhood. But on to last night. Yellow's cat got out, and we were looking for him. We exhausted everywhere except the desert. Yellow wanted to go, but these few weeks have been creepy and stressful, and we're both small girls. So I agreed, but we were gonna go prepared. Me and Yellow went back home and got flashlights, backup batteries, two knives each, and my metal baseball bat. Yellow's boyfriend Green tagged along, which made me feel safer because he is tall and is the captain of the wrestling team. He brought a stun gun after we told him why we were prepared for the worst. So me, Yellow, and Brown went into the desert and searched for her cat. The entire time, I couldn't stop staring at the mountain in the distance. After everything that has been going on, being in this area scared the living crap out of me. That is when we heard the meowing in the distance. It definitely sounded like Yellow's cat. The only issue is that it was coming from the direction of the creepy mountain. Yellow started to go in that direction. Green and I followed soon after. Yellow said something that I already assumed, but wished was wrong. This is towards where me and Brown saw the tents. I started thinking the worst. We're gonna get killed, or we're gonna get sold into trafficking. My thoughts were going crazy, and my anxiety shot through the roof. That's when Green looked through his binoculars and said that he saw the tent. I quickly snatched them away and looked, and sure enough, three big military tents, and not far behind it was the mountain. If it wasn't for the lights in the camp, I wouldn't be able to see anything in the dark. But I examined as much as I could. I didn't see a man circling, though I did see what looked to be a military truck pulling in, then four soldier-looking people hopped into the truck, and it went toward the mountain. The three of us just watched in the quiet and practically jumped to Mars when we heard a meow behind us. 
Sure enough, Yellow's cat was right there, happy and purring. We all collectively laughed at how silly we were, and then we picked up the cat and calmly went back home. On our way, we joked at how we had just stumbled on a military post. Nothing else. We got home and the cat went and stared out the back door into the dark backyard, which I thought was weird, but then again, it's a cat and they do weird stuff all the time. I woke up to my mom yelling. Apparently, someone had gotten into the fridge and eaten tonight's dinner. She said it was an animal, but my dogs were in my room with me, so she assumed that it was the cat. Yellow shrugged it off and cleaned it up. But the weirdest thing was that it did look like the cat did it, as there was clumps of raw meat in his fur and around his mouth. But it looked like a bear had gotten into our fridge, and that the cat had just continued to stare out the window, only stopping about a few hours ago and sleeping. I got curious, and decided to walk out into the desert while it was day out. Safe, right? Well, that's what I thought, and I was wrong. I went with that baseball bat and Green's binoculars and followed the exact same path and you probably guessed it. Not a single tent or sign of anything, but there was a coyote just sitting where the tents had been. It was staring up at me with strange eyes and a crooked face. I heard it howl, but I didn't see it howl. I took a step back and it stepped forward. Then I booked it. I didn't want to be that dumb white girl in the horror movie who lingers around and gets killed, but running seemed like a scarier option. I sprinted all the way home with the sounds of growling and howling directly in my ear. I swear I could feel the breath on the back of my neck, but I never turned around. If I was going to die, I was going to die looking forward. As soon as I hit gravel, the noise stopped, and for whatever reason, I immediately turned around, ready to swing with my bat, and all I saw was the back of a man walking back to the mountain with his hands in his long, black trench coat. From behind, I could see that he was bald and wore jet-black sunglasses. His skin was pale as snow, and he wore a fedora-like hat on his head. I stared at him until he was gone, and not once did he turn around. I'm home now, more confused, more creeped out than anything else. I think I might investigate further, but I don't know. A while back, I was chosen to be in an indie film about djinns, basically the local versions of demons. Before I continue, there are four things you should know about them. One, it is said that they can take the form of animals and humans with circle eyes, literally circles for eyes. Two, they are supposedly born from smokeless fire. Three, they feed on energy, such as the energy you use to stay awake and the energy used to power electronics. And four, an extra one. There are Christian jinns, Muslim jinns, you name it. They have their own free will, so everyone is different. Some are very nice, others not so much. So now for the tale. We were filming in the desert and a series of events started to occur. Right when we arrived, there was instantly a presence of something there. Then a knife, bent, twisted, with red marks, started appearing at my feet every 15 meters or so. Constantly, for the entire time that I was in the desert, this knife would follow me. Four nights or so into filming, right as we were packing up, a loud screech could be heard. It was sort of a mix between a falcon, a wolf, and a mountain lion. It was later revealed to us by an expert of desert animals that there were no animals in the desert that made that sort of sound. On the fifth night, things began to get interesting. At one point we were sitting down taking a break when the sand just started to smoke. We thought that maybe a small plant had combusted because of the heat. After a minute or two, the smoke stopped. We checked and there was no plant. 
We sat back down and the second our butts hit the seat, boom, the sand all around the smoking area and where the smoke had been burst into flames with zero reasons to. Then, after that, all of our cameras started to lose their batteries very, very quickly. This was frightening because, one, it meant that we had to stay there longer, and two, as mentioned in number three at the top, they feed on energy. The next night, albino scorpions, which are extremely rare, started sprinting toward the actors, literally going at full speed. We were forced to kill these rare creatures by burning them with a torch, and every time one died, two would replace it. Literally, two more would come out of nowhere, full speed ahead. This continued for several minutes. Things like this kept happening for the entire two weeks or so that we were at the site. When we finished filming, we split up for a bit to let the director edit some stuff. Then we had to film parts at a house. It is important here to mention that the movie was called 3 a.m. We were talking and one of the actors stated that since we had to split up, he had woken up at 3 a.m. every morning, his dogs going crazy, his alarm clock going off, and his AC setting itself to 3 degrees Celsius. Two of the other actors revealed that the same thing had been happening to them. At the same time, I had never felt alone while I was in my room at night. Something was watching us. It followed us home. Since then, we have finished the film. I've started praying for protection every night based on the events that have happened. The actor who originally had the alarm go off at 3 a.m. moved to another house. Another actor moved to Canada. We were filming in UAE, which is in the Middle East, so this was pretty far away. The second actor also moved internationally, and I am moving in four weeks or so. I'm just hoping that it doesn't follow me home again. Let me start this off by saying that it is imperative that you stay off of the deep web. No matter what anyone tells you, no good can come from using it, and I am about to inform you as to why. I was 15 at the time. I had come home from school on a Friday afternoon ready to relax, kick back, and enjoy the short break. I had started using code about a year prior. Nothing too fancy, just basic Python, Java, HTTP, etc. And was practicing it daily. Now, I had known about the dark web before this took place. I would sometimes buy weed off of it, but that was about the extent. This particular day, however, I decided to venture further and really take a look at the dark web. I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with the iceberg diagram representing the internet's content. For those who don't know, the surface web contains about 10% of the internet's content, while the deep and dark web take up over 90%. I was ready to see what it really held. I heard stories about what goes down on the deep web, murder, inhumane torture, etc. But I didn't really believe that they were all legit. So I hopped on tour and began to see what I could dig up. I started off by going on the hidden wiki and browsing through various websites, most of which contained illegal things such as drugs, hackers, and hitmen for hire, and lots of CP. I clicked on a random forum link, which took about a minute to load. I wish I could remember the name of it. It was a forum where people could pick a topic that they wanted to talk about, such as politics, dealing with mental health, etc. I noticed one of the topics was a pedo forum, and I don't want to even go into detail on what I saw there. There was one particular one that caught my eye. The link was all in red, while the rest were all black. It said, not for the weak. Enter at your own risk. Curious as to what this was, I click on the link and it brought me to a forum that had only one other link on the whole page. I clicked that link and it brought me into a chat room. I realized that nobody was saying anything in it, only sending links. This set off alarm bells in my head because I had an idea of what was on those links. I wish that I had listened to my gut feeling, which was telling me to close out while you still can. 
However, the ignorant, curious teen took over me, and I started setting up some protection for myself using the code that I had learned. I later realized that this amateur coding I did would not protect me from these advanced people with malicious intent. I clicked on a random link and a page loaded surprisingly fast. It looked to be another chat room. I went to type hello or something, but it wouldn't let me. I sighed and began moving my mouse to go to the previous page when a noise went off. I had received a chat. The message said, Hello, new user. I see you have found my site. Would you like to continue? I tried typing again, but I still couldn't. The next message sent chills down my back, and my hands were shaking. It read, No, son. Not the keyboard. I tried turning off my computer, of course, but nothing worked. Another message popped up saying, I guess I'll take that as a no. The screen suddenly changed, and a video began playing. It was a black screen, but I could hear a deep male voice say, Unfortunately for you, you do not have a choice. I grabbed a sticky note and put it over my webcam, and the voice on the screen said, Ah, so we're playing games now, huh? The video then began to change, and I realized the man was taking his hand off the camera. He was a short man, maybe 5'7 tops, but that brought me no comfort. He held up a knife and said, Name any body part. I then for the first time noticed a cloth in the corner of the room, covering up something which I could only assume to be a body. I had had enough. I unplugged my computer and lay on the floor panting for hours until I could finally get up. I now suffer from anxiety and won't touch a computer unless I absolutely have to. I only know this story because it was told to me by a family member. I don't have much recollection of it myself. When I was younger, my mom ran an old people's home, so we lived there and I knew a lot of the people who also lived there. When I was about four or five, my family and I used to love going to visit different towns and cities, check out all the landmarks. I can't remember which town it was, but we visited the church there. We were just having a look around, as you do, when suddenly as I was looking across the pews, I saw a lady. She was just sitting there, not bothering anyone at all, but apparently I burst out crying and started begging to leave. Once we got out, I'm told I kept saying that it was one of the ladies who lived in the home that my mom ran. The issue was, she had died a few weeks prior. None of my family ever saw her. The only thing I remember properly is seeing her and just being absolutely terrified. I have no idea why, but I do remember the fear itself. It was real and very intense. I still see things on occasion. Sometimes the fear is there. Sometimes it isn't. I was in the Marine Corps from 2008 to 2012. I served as an infantry Marine and was stationed in 29 Palms, California. In 2009, while training for my first deployment, we went to a specialty school called Marine Corps Cold Weather Mountain Warfare School, which was located in Bridgeport, California. I enjoyed the five-ish hour bus ride up Highway 395 through the Sierra Nevada Mountains. I took in the beautiful scenery as my mind wondered about what I was in for, dreading climbing the 12,000-foot mountains that littered the landscape. Weeks of training go by. I was relieved to hear that we were moving to a place called Hawthorne to do some live fire exercises. It was about 30 miles away to the east back into the desert, an old out-of-commission army base that was deemed uninhabitable in the 50s for various reasons. I was enthusiastic to escape the bitterly cold temps up on the mountain. Slept on the ride there. Upon waking, I looked out the window and was shocked at what I saw. Remnants of the old base scattered the landscape. 
halfway destroyed buildings, guard towers, and other typical military stuff that you'd expect to see. Behind that lied jagged, lava rock mountains casting their shadows over the destroyed buildings. The place looked like a nuclear bomb had gone off nearby. Have you ever seen the old nuclear test videos from when it was first developed? They would stage a fake town to analyze what the blast would do. This place was like that mixed with that game series Fallout and Chernobyl if you've ever heard of that. As we drove in further, I noticed a bunch of mine shafts heading into the sides of the mountains. Now, I was very curious as to where we would be staying at. I was relieved to hear that there was a makeshift FOB. Nothing fancy by any means, just an old green tent for the NCOs and upper-ranking battalion staff. Us boots would be sleeping under the stars, in the dirt. At least we had a makeshift HESCO wall around us to make things feel like home. During chow that evening, we were all sitting around talking. I asked my sergeant, what are all the mine shafts in the hillside for? He said they were munitions storage facilities as well as fallout shelter. The place was designed during the Cold War era, which made it super creepy. It's like all the people just decided one day to leave. Vehicles were still there, everything. It was strange. Night arrives. It was fairly hot out even though it was night as we were back down in the desert. I was having problems sleeping, even though I was just in my skivvies on top of my sleeping bag. Some of the others were awake talking, I could hear. I stared into the stars and mountains looming over me. It was a full moon that night with hardly any clouds. As I was scanning the mountaintops, which, if I had to guess, were around 500 to 700 feet above me, where we were all sleeping made it seem that I could almost reach out and touch the top. I saw something strange moving about at the peak. Figuring my eyes were playing tricks on me from extreme physical exhaustion and sleep deprivation, I disregarded it. Even later that night, I awoke to go take a pee. As I'm utilizing the head, I look up to where I saw something earlier. To my surprise, the strange, silhouetted figures were there scurrying about the ridge line. Now this has definitely caught my interest as my mind was wandering. Thankfully, I had a lot of cool stuff lying in my pack. Once at my gear, I grabbed my trusty PVS-14 night vision monocular. I bring them to my eye and look back up. Nothing? That can't be right. Like, huh? I swear I saw something. I look over to a buddy of mine that was awake and asked, Hey, did you see anything up there? He looks at me and says, What are you talking about, bro? I said, forget it. A few more hours go by through the night, and a loud crash comes from the closest mine shaft, which was located a hundred feet or so from the FOB. Literally half the platoon sat straight up from a dead sleep. One of the sergeants screams from nearby and says it hit the rack. It was just some rocks falling, which made sense to most of us. The next morning, we woke up and did what we had planned to do for that day. Later that afternoon, we had some free time, and were creeping around checking the nearby buildings out. Four of us decided to go down into a building. It was half above ground and half below. The wide staircase went down to open up into a larger cubicle-type area. Barely any light came through the small windows. I clicked on my weapon light and scanned the room. There were still papers and everything strewn about on top of the desks. We followed the hallway, which made a right turn. MOPP suits and gas masks lined the hallway, hanging on hooks. We see a sign above one of the doorways that said, Girls' Locker Room. Us being the typical 19-year-old Marines that we were, we decided that we had to check that out. I took point and entered the pitch-black room. I was looking through the lockers to try and find something interesting when all of a sudden, the door behind us slams shut. We all ran like hell out the other door on the other side.
The night of October 30th through the morning of the 31st, myself and the group that I belong to were invited to do a live investigation with the radio station 93Q in Houston at Spaghetti Warehouse. Spaghetti Warehouse is a restaurant known as one of the most haunted places in the country, and definitely the most haunted place in Houston. Even though I knew this, I didn't do any research on the place before I went, so that I wouldn't be influenced by what I might experience. All I knew was that the place had been a pharmaceutical warehouse during the Civil War, and that a manager had died falling down the elevator shaft years ago. I arrived for the overnight around 10.30 p.m. and was locked in until 6 a.m. I started off just exploring the building and getting a sense of it. The restaurant had two floors and a basement. While I was exploring and setting up cameras and sound recorders, we heard something large move in the woman's bathroom upstairs. We went in and noticed that the garbage can was out of place. We moved it back to the very exact spot where it had been and left the bathroom. About five minutes later, we heard it move again. I went back in and noticed that the garbage can had been moved about a foot from where we had placed it back before. Obviously, I realized that something was going on, so I grabbed one of the DJs and we went in to try to capture EVPs or electronic voice phenomenon. Basically, unexplained voices or sounds that are too low for the human ear, but able to be picked up by our sound equipment. I placed a camera down and started asking questions to try to get any sort of response or communication. After you've been on a lot of cases, you learn to trust your instincts, and you can almost feel when something is around or not right. It has nothing to do with being psychic, just trusting your intuition when your senses are heightened and on guard. That's exactly what I got. It was the strongest that I've ever felt. It was threatening, and like something was right in my face. I felt many presences before, but nothing truly uncomfortable. I remember staring blankly for a second while not speaking, then saying, Man, I gotta sit down, I feel so drained. Which I did. After about 30 more minutes, we left without noticing much else in the bathroom. About an hour or so passed, and one investigator had his voice recorder move right in front of him, and a few others saw wine glasses shake by themselves. We all witnessed faint shadows move across the windows downstairs where light from the outside would penetrate in. You would just notice darkness block out the light and then move away again. We also heard faint voices throughout the night. The whole place had a very creepy vibe and you constantly felt like someone was watching you or around you. At about 3 a.m., I decided to take a break and sit at a table upstairs to listen to the audio that I had recorded earlier in the bathroom. Normally, I would have waited until the next day, but because we were with the radio station, they wanted some sort of evidence to broadcast when they went live at 6. But also, because I felt so strong about what I had sensed, and I was eager to see if I had caught anything. I sat down and started searching for the spot on the audio where I got the weird feeling, while also keeping an eye out to notice anything unusual going on upstairs. After a few minutes, I found the spot, and sure enough, right after I said, I need to sit down, there was a faint but clear voice. It said, hey, what are you staring at? This excited me, but it was nothing compared to what I was about to experience. A few seconds later, a sixth sense told me to look up, and when I did, I clearly saw a woman in white, wearing a gown with a bonnet on her head, smoothly walk into the wall. The apparition was about 20 feet away. It only lasted a split second, but it was very clear, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I didn't tell anyone until later so that I wouldn't influence the other investigators. At about 4 a.m., I started taking pictures of the downstairs area since no one else was around, and I planned to eventually make it down to the basement. The first floor felt calm, but there was one hallway that led to the basement that had a weird vibe to it. You felt watched. Nothing came up on the pictures, so I headed towards the hallway and the basement. The hallway was about 10 feet long, and had a door at the end where light would shine through. 
As I turned to enter, I saw a shadow, as if it were some sort of being, that completely blocked out the light and was very large. It was straight ahead of my face and about five feet away. Again, it was only for a second, but I clearly, visibly saw a head with shoulders, arms, and a long lower body. I think I scared it as much as it scared me, because it instantly ran toward me and right by me on my left side. Every hair on my body stood up, and my camera completely shut itself off. For the first and only time, I didn't proceed further right away. I was stunned. Actually, I took a step back to collect my thoughts and fix the camera. It wouldn't work until I completely left the area. I figured it was break time, and took about 20 more minutes. Later on, I went down to the basement with another investigator. For the last hour down there, we experienced cold spots and smaller things, but nothing really that unusual. After the radio show, I packed up and left Spaghetti Warehouse drained, tired, freaked out, and with the absolute certainty that there is life after death. It changes you as a person. In the Wicca religion, they say that Halloween is the day when the dead can freely roam our world. I never believed that, and thought it was always psychic BS, but I'll never doubt it again. I have been fascinated by ghosts and the supernatural my entire life. I've had a few experiences here and there, but this one in particular was the most significant and frightening. First, some background. My dad's side of the family is Native American, and some have a deep suspicion of owls. They're considered evil omens. Anyways, my grandmother was very, very attuned to spirits. She had the so-called second sight. She had a whole wealth of stories about her encounters with the paranormal, who she passed on to my aunt. But anywho, this next bit is relevant. A few months before she passed away from lupus, she woke up in a panic and came running into my aunt's room. My grandmother was generally a stoic, unflappable woman, so this was not like her. She dragged my aunt into her bedroom, asking if she heard it. My aunt heard nothing. What my grandmother had heard was the so-called death owl. She passed on not too long after that. Fast forward about ten years or so. I'm up around 4 a.m. watching TV. As I recall, it was around December of 2008. I heard this noise outside. It sounded like a woman weeping. The best way I can describe it was a voice that was caught between an owl's cry and a human's. It was very unnatural. I got a cold feeling in my gut because I knew. I knew exactly what it was, and it scared the ever-loving crap out of me. I remember being paralyzed with fear. I grew up out in the country, and I know what an owl sounds like. I've also heard bobcats, foxes, and the dying screams of rabbits. This? This was none of those things. Others have tried to claim that it was just an animal, but it was like no other animal I've ever heard. That, that unearthly wailing noise. Like it was in mourning. It was the kind of sound that freezes the blood in your veins. At the time, I thought it might be foretelling my father's imminent death, since if you hear it, it either means that you or a family member is going to die. Or it predicts great disaster. And for clarification at the time, my dad was having some significant heart trouble. But he's much better now. Now comes the twist. On April 9th, 2009, a huge wildfire swept through my area. A lot of houses burned down, and mine was among them. When we came back, my home was nothing but a pile of smoking rubble. 
It took me a bit to make the connection, but I am positive that the Death Owl, or Banshee, was an omen that predicted this disaster. One thing's for sure, I hope to God that I never hear that thing again, because I will never forget it. I have a suspicion that this thing stalks my family. I can't be certain. I'll have to do some research into my family tree. I know this might sound unbelievable to some, but I swear till the day that I die that this is all 100% true. So there you have it, folks. My most significant paranormal encounter. On our way home from a camping trip, my family stopped by the Oak Springs Trilobite site to fossil hunt. If you don't know the southeastern Nevada desert, the attractions are low to moderately traveled and you will often be one of the only visitors. This site in particular was empty and we were the only people there. A quarter mile trail leads you to a shale deposit where you can sift through for fossils. Shortly after starting out, I heard a man call out conversationally. Not really shouting, but talking loudly enough to communicate with someone a distance away. I was facing west on a south-facing slope, and he sounded like he was down and to the left, closer to me than the highway. I paused and took a look around. There was no dust, or engine noises, or anything like that. No crunching of footsteps. Nothing. There were flies buzzing about, and I decided that a bug had just buzzed in my ear. A minute later, I heard another man call out, this time up the slope to my right. Probably just another bug. Sounds can get weird in rocky canyons, so it was no biggie. We came upon the site, dug around for about 30 minutes, and found a few unimpressive specimens, so we headed back for the truck. At this point, I had forgotten all about the voices. Driving away, I asked Hubs, what did you think? Pretty cool? I'm the rock hound, and never know if he's enjoying my hobby as much as I am. He replied, sure, yeah, it was actually pretty cool. Pause. But I kept hearing these voices, and I couldn't tell where they were coming from. He had a face shield up over his ears at the time, making it unlikely that a bug could have possibly buzzed in there. He said that he was hearing them on the way back to the truck, and heard them calling out at least three times. Caliente is nearby, and Pioche a ways further, and both towns have histories dating back to ye old mining days and Mormon frontiering. There are lots of railroad, gunfight, and native raid stories, and some weird Warren Jeffs type stuff. Not to mention Area 51 being sorta slash relatively nearby. Now, we are both atheists and skeptics. We don't believe in ghost stories, and neither of us have ever had a paranormal experience. But this one has us scratching our heads. I'm married with three kids. The kids are older. 20, 17, and 10. We just bought a house and moved in the first week of December. Our room and my daughter's rooms are upstairs, and my 20-year-old son has a room in the basement. There's a storage room across from his room, then a big area with a fireplace where I have my gaming console, TV, and chair set up. Anyhow, on Christmas Day, the wife and kids were getting ready to go to her dad's house. I wasn't going because me and her dad didn't get along. I fire up the PlayStation in the basement and put on my headset. They're all upstairs running around because they're going to be late, and I see my son come downstairs and head into his room to grab something. A few minutes go by and I'm focusing on my game. Out of the corner of my eye, I see what I thought was my son leave his room and walk into the storage room, then slam the door hard and loud enough that I hear it through my noise-canceling headset. I pull off my headset and yell, What the hell, man? and look over at the storage room. The house is quiet. I walk over and open the storage room door. It's a 10 by 10 room with no windows and nothing in it. 
I look in his room, but he's not in there. I go upstairs, and they've already left. The van is gone. I told my wife about it, and she just laughed. Funny thing is, I never mentioned it to my son, but the other day I came home from work and he says, Damn, Dad, I could hear you in the gaming room until like 4 a.m. I'm surprised you made it to work this morning. Me and all the girls had gone to bed by 9 p.m. the night before. As a kid growing up, I dealt with anger problems and would always let my emotions get the best of me, so my mom would always send me off to these residential programs. However, they weren't all that bad. If you did good, you could go on these what they called passes. It's when if you do good, you can come home for X amount of hours. So I was doing good and already had been on a few of these passes, and I got to come home for 48 hours. It was Halloween and me, my mom, my sister, and a couple of friends got together and went to this haunted house. So when we arrived, there's a line of people who are waiting to enter, and I had to take a leak really bad because I had sat in the car for hours waiting to get there. I walked to the side of the building, and there's nothing but woods literally growing next to the building, like there were tree branches leaning against and on the structure. So, as I was taking this long leak, I heard something step on a couple of sticks, and I noticed a dark shadow figure on all fours creeping up toward me. It looked kind of like a human on all fours, but this was definitely not a human. Like I said earlier, I've dealt with a lot of problems during my childhood. I didn't even have a childhood, so I was very different from a lot of people in so many ways. I didn't have a big reaction to it, I just kind of watched it and made sure that I wasn't seeing things. I tried to keep an eye on it and called my friends over to where I was to get a look. They were caught up in a conversation though and weren't paying attention, so I tried to run over to get them and get their attention and then run back to make sure this thing was still there. By the time I got them and ran over to the area, there was nothing. This thing had disappeared without a trace. I couldn't even explain to them what just happened. They didn't pay much attention to me after that. A couple of weeks went by and I just forgot about it and let it be. I was reading somebody's Reddit post today where they talked about their mother being scared because she heard three knocks and related it to the three knock omen, which I had never heard of. I decided to do some research on it, and apparently there's a superstition around hearing three knocks because it's supposedly followed by a death in the family or someone that's close to you. That has happened to me. A couple years ago, I went to a mountain resort in California for a little over a month and stayed with my sister and brother-in-law who lived there. Around the same time when I came, they got a new roommate. He was a nice guy, maybe in his late 20s, early 30s, an ex-alcoholic, but overall, just a really great guy. I spent a lot of my summer going on hikes and playing video games with him and my brother-in-law, and I would say that I got to know him pretty well, but not as well as my sister and her husband did. The roommate, Jack, had lost a close friend a year or so before when he got drunk and decided to fall asleep outside in the middle of a snowstorm, which apparently happens more often than you would think. Since then, Jack had never so much as touched a beer, and he was quite proud of it. Anyways, it was around my third or fourth week there, when my sister and I were watching The Baba Duke, and it was pretty late at night, around 1, maybe 2 a.m. The movie ended, and she was going to let me sleep in the room with her since Jack and her husband were out camping or something, but I don't really remember what they were doing. It was silent in the house, and all the lights were off when we heard three loud, distinct knocking sounds. I asked her if she had heard them, and she said yes, but it was probably just the dryer making noises upstairs. It was a fairly new dryer that didn't make any sound. 
Maybe around 10 minutes later, we heard the same three knocks again, but my sister rode it off to the dryer being noisy once more. It didn't sound like a broken dryer since it was three obvious knocks though. I don't want to go too far into the history of the house or anything, but it was definitely haunted. Things would randomly fly off of shelves and the lights would randomly turn themselves off. Also, some of the furniture that the house came with had what we thought were blood stains. I wrote that night off to the spirit in their house messing with us since we were watching a scary movie, up until today when I put everything together. Two days after I left, they found Jack dead in his room upstairs. They said he drank himself to death which was surprising considering how proud he was of getting sober. Maybe the death knocks were real, or maybe not. Maybe it was all just a coincidence. What do you think? Also, I should probably also mention that he had a bad liver from his previous drinking problem. I don't really know how that works, but I guess one night of extremely heavy drinking did it for him. I didn't push for more information about his death since it really shook my sister up. All she said was that he drank himself to death. Disclaimer. In no way am I saying that death knocks are 100% real or that if you hear them, a family member or friend will definitely drop dead. As for the furniture that we thought had blood on it, it might not have been blood. Maybe it was just an odd colored stain from where something had been spilled. I'm not saying that I'm sure that Jack's death was related to anything that happened in the house. I just made the connection and found it fascinating. There are many stories from border crossers. Many people see ghosts and other things. I knew this one lady, she was a friend of my parents. She crossed to the desert to get to the US. She was with a group of people and the coyote led them. It was nighttime and the people rested. The coyote said to keep going because they'd lost a lot of time so they got up and continued walking. Well, they came in front of this bushy-like place, and when you crossed, the tips of the branches caught your clothes. It was dark and hard to see, but they were in a line and followed each other. The lady I know was tired from walking just like everyone else was, but she said there was this old man next to her who complained about how he was in pain and just too tired to continue. Soon they passed by this trench. It was so dark that you couldn't see how far down it was before it stopped. They walked next to the trench and the old lady told me that the bushes kept scratching her face and getting at her clothing. The lady then said that she turned around to look at the old man next to her and saw that he had tripped and fallen down in the trench, but he didn't make any noise. The lady got scared and panicked. She told her husband and the husband told the coyote to stop that a man fell in the ditch. The coyote had a flashlight and he shined it down into the trench and it wasn't that deep. He went down with the flashlight, but he didn't see any man. The lady told her husband that she knew he was there. She said that he fell right in front of her. The coyote was getting impatient. He looked everywhere, but still couldn't see anyone. He never found the man and obviously he couldn't have made it very far in such a short amount of time. I guess he thought that she was lying or something, and decided to keep on moving. Soon they crossed the desert safely and all. The lady said that she thought it was weird how he fell. She said that it was a trip, but it was like he was sinking in his fall. She asked the others if they had seen him fall, and they all said no. The lady never saw that old man in the group after that. I don't really like this story because it makes me think of what might have taken him. I also heard that there are giant bugs in the desert or something like that. My family visited her house. When she told us this story, I was super scared and kept thinking about it at night. 
There are many people crossing the desert that have seen dead people walking around and see weird things following them at night. I was 14 at the time of this story. My mom was a pretty hardcore Christian. She went to this church for a long while, and every year they had this drama called Hell Night. It was during the week of Halloween, Halloween being the last night to do it. Basically, it was a drama where a certain made-up character would die and be judged by God and show what their life was like and on and on. Anywho, my mother played a demon in this and said she had a certain outfit that she had to wear with white contacts and the whole getup. One day after getting home from school, the house was empty. Or so I thought. Out bursts my mother from her room in the back of our long hallway in her full costume on all fours, crawling toward me like she was legit possessed. I almost shit myself. So, Halloween night comes, and I decide to stay home from this night of the drama. It usually lasts until 1am or longer, and I still had school to worry about. So I'm hanging out at home, ignoring the knocks on the door because I had no candy. Well, I'm sitting on the couch watching TV, and I hear my mother's room door swing wide open. I get off the couch, and peek down the hallway, and there she is. On all fours, looking dead at me but I couldn't see her face because the wig was covering it. As she crawled towards me, in my head I was thinking, nice try, but I'm not falling for this again. But this time, it's a hell of a lot faster, and she makes a hard left down two sets of stairs into our finished basement. After that, I didn't hear anything else that night. Mind you, my mother was still at our church, in the middle of doing the drama, and she didn't get home for a couple more hours. Typing this brought back that feeling. I can't explain it. But I know that whatever I saw was not my mother. I was 14 at the time of this story. My mom was a pretty hardcore Christian. She went to this church for a long while, and every year they had this drama called Hell Night. It was during the week of Halloween, Halloween being the last night to do it. Basically, it was a drama where a certain made-up character would die and be judged by God and show what their life was like and on and on. Anywho, my mother played a demon in this and said she had a certain outfit that she had to wear with white contacts and the whole getup. One day after getting home from school, the house was empty. Or so I thought. Out bursts my mother from her room in the back of our long hallway in her full costume on all fours, crawling toward me like she was legit possessed. I almost shit myself. So Halloween night comes, and I decide to stay home from this night of the drama. It usually lasts until 1am or longer, and I still had school to worry about. So I'm hanging out at home, ignoring the knocks on the door because I had no candy. Well, I'm sitting on the couch watching TV, and I hear my mother's room door swing wide open. I get off the couch and peek down the hallway, and there she is, on all fours, looking dead at me. But I couldn't see her face because the wig was covering it. As she crawled towards me, in my head I was thinking, nice try, but I'm not falling for this again. But this time, it's a hell of a lot faster, and she makes a hard left down two sets of stairs into our finished basement. After that, I didn't hear anything else that night. Mind you, my mother was still at our church, in the middle of doing the drama, and she didn't get home for a couple more hours. Typing this brought back that feeling. I can't explain it. But I know that whatever I saw was not my mother.
There has always been folklore around black crows and their cawing that my mother has always believed in. I've always been in love with anything creepy, so I bought into black crows aesthetically, but never actually believed that they served as an omen for death, as they're commonly known for. That was until I was told this story later in my life. My mother is from Central America and was born and raised there, only moving to the United States around 2000. She's always been superstitious. She would tell me when I was a kid to be careful around crows. Try not to let one fly in my path or disturb one because they symbolize death and can predict it if someone in your life is about to die. I was just a kid, so, again, I never really believed any of that and just promised to follow these rules to please her. It was still hot and sunny out when I was beginning elementary school, and my mother and father were at home painting our back deck as we had just moved into a new house. This was the first house that we lived in since my mother moved from Central America to the States. All of my mother's family were thousands of miles away from her. She was always worried that something would happen to someone in her family while she was gone. My father was on all fours painting the deck, and my mother had come outside to give him a drink when a black crow swooped down right over my father's head. My mother immediately began to panic and cry. Before my father had a chance to ask her what was wrong, the home phone rang. My mother picked up the phone, crying, and burst into Spanish, asking, Is it Dad? And what happened? Before she even knew who was on the other side of the call. It was my mother's family, calling to tell her that her father had indeed just passed away. I came home that evening, and my father explained that my grandfather had passed on, but he didn't tell me of the crow story. When I was a little older, my mother had told me the story, and my father confirmed the order of the events. That story is so strange to me, and ever since then, I, too, have been wary of crows and their presence in my life. My mother said that she just knew her father had died in that moment. When the phone rang, she knew she was getting THE phone call. I find it interesting that the crow flew so low over my father, perhaps directly symbolizing that a father figure in someone's life had passed away. Where I live, around that time of year, a crow should have been nowhere in sight. There had not been any around that day, or for months even. All of it is just a little too bizarre and creeps me out to this day. So back in high school, I was a rather shy girl. This was during or after the recession, and my family had gotten a bit tight on money. Usually I didn't eat lunch, and I had to hide that fact from the staff at the school, so I studied in the library or sat outside on the field behind the school for lunch. Rarely had I ever eaten or sat in the lunch room. As the school year went on and neared its end, prom was coming up. I never had enough money for a prom dress, so I always turned down any offers to go, simply because I didn't want people to know that I couldn't afford a dress, let alone the ticket to go in. Between classes, when I had to walk through the cafeteria, I noticed that there was a younger boy who would always stare at me. His friends would pat his shoulder, and I read one of their lips one day as they told him to, quote-unquote, ask her. The group of boys just looking and smiling, except for the nervous one who was simply staring at me. I would look away to the floor and grip my textbooks closer to my chest, walking down another hallway. Anyway, I kept finding ways to sort of get past him without him noticing. Now I know this sounds mean, but I didn't know him. I couldn't afford it, and I also felt like... like he was dark inside. It was like every time I saw him, all I saw was a gray smoke around him and there was a really uneasy feeling about it. Anyway, prom happened, and I lived right down the street from the high school, so I could hear the music and see all the kids driving down the road or walking to the school in their cool new clothes. 
As I sat there looking at the lights and the kids, I decided it was stupid to just watch the event happen without me, so I would made myself go to sleep. A week or so after prom, I heard other kids in school talking about something, almost whispering. Apparently, the boy who wanted to ask me out to prom, he ended up asking another girl from another school. She said yes, but when she showed up to the house, her dad didn't like him and said that she shouldn't go. The boy then told the girl that he couldn't go to prom with her because something had come up and he wouldn't be going to prom with her at all. Those were his words. The father and the boy talked about it, and the father said that if he paid a portion for her dress, then they could go. The kid went back to the house and cut the screen to the back door with a knife. Then he unlocked it. Her father woke up and asked him what he was doing there, and the boy said, I came to see you die. Before charging at the father with a knife and a shovel, he managed to stab her dad seven times. Her parents subdued the kid, and he was arrested and released on a $10,000 bond. The rest is history. So that's my prom night story. Oh yeah, and the dad did survive, which was great. My friend Ava hasn't lived with her mom in over two years since she moved in with her boyfriend. But recently, I went back to her mom's house with her to grab some plants that she had propagated and have lunch. It was a normal day and I had been in the house many, many times before, so it wasn't any different. The visit was short, but when they went upstairs to discuss what they should do with her old room, I was left my own devices on the first floor. The basement didn't have a door to the downstairs and the dining room was adjacent to it. So naturally, I decided to look down the stairs since it always gave me a spook. I'm not really a huge fan of the paranormal, and I never really had a cut and dry experience. I also never quote unquote pick up on vibes either, but I hated the vibe of her mom's place, especially the basement. When I went to the stairs, I looked down them and saw a weird humanoid figure in the darkness staring back at me. My entire body felt fuzzy, and I couldn't move until I heard Ava and her mom coming back down the stairs, and I hightailed it away from there. Not really sure what it was, but Ava has always said that the house was haunted, and that she avoids the basement like the plague. The desert is a scary place for me now. It used to be a place filled with peace and serenity, but since living out there for almost 30 years, you see things. This occurrence took place in the high desert of California in the early 1990s. The whole town was once all military. There's a military plant there and a prison, and the streets to this day consist of numbers and letters, for example, Avenue O and 178th Street. You always heard stories of people missing and underground tunnels, confirmed. In fact, a friend of mine kept getting a draft coming from his closet in his childhood home. Later, after he grew up, he checked it out and found an opening to one of these such tunnels. He called me over to check it out, but after I got there and we went through the opening, I was too freaked out to go more than 10 feet in when I turned around and told him that this might be how people disappear. You always saw things late at night, off in the distance far past the lights of that then small town. Strange, glowing, different colored lights that would move around low or zigzag, then shoot straight up. We saw things in the sky, just stuff you never talked about. Life was pretty carefree back then. If you wanted to visit friends, though, you would have to drive down long desert roads and sometimes end up coming home late at night in the pitch black because there were no street lights. I recall coming home late one such night with my boyfriend at the time and another friend, and we pulled over for some reason. Something compelled me to get out of the car and look up at the stars. We were in the middle of nowhere, but we could hear what sounded like machinery and muffled clanks like metal. We all started looking around, but didn't see anything. Just then, we felt a vibration under our feet. I crouched down on the street to put my ear to the ground. 
It was coming from under us. We all listened intently and heard far down voices but couldn't make out what was being said. We stood up and were discussing what it might have been when we saw a small red light on the horizon and it was getting closer. We piled into the car and got out of Dodge. We only told a few friends and they said that they had experienced the same thing. A year later I told a friend that I started a small hauling business. Still, there was a big job, so I needed to borrow a trailer. He said he had a few that I could use, so I should come out to his property to check them out. It was just starting to get dark when he pulled out his new toy. It was a pair of military-grade night vision binoculars. He told me to wait until it got dark to leave, because he wanted to show me something creepy, and I was all in. Later, we walked towards the back of his property, looking out at nothing. No lights, no roads, nothing but a barren desert. He pointed the binoculars east, and oh my. There were people coming out of the ground and moving around. I said, what the hell am I looking at? And he told me that his family called them ground dwellers, and that they are located in various parts of the desert. It gave me the heebie-jeebies. Needless to say, I never went to his house after dark again. At one point in my life, I lived in a mobile home park, a little past Avenue F. There was a massive treehouse in my yard that was left by a former tenant. The only way to get up into it was through a hole cut in the floor with a door on it, and under that was a rope ladder. One night, I was sitting on the porch drinking a cup of tea when I heard something move up in the treehouse, and then a head popped up. It was a lady and her husband hiding. Clearly, I thought they were on drugs. I told them to come down from there, but they both refused. It wasn't until I threatened to call the authorities did they cautiously comply, looking all around, not wanting to be seen. By now, there's a small group of my friends and nosy neighbors gathering around. I saw that she was terrified by something, so I asked them to come in. I made them something to eat and waited for her to calm down. Then the lady reached in her bag and pulled out some papers. They looked like legal documents with government letterhead. There were drawings and schematics, and some of them even had embossed seals. I couldn't help but notice that they had water and smoke damage, and a few of them were burnt on the edges. She told me that they were checking out this place off of Barrel Springs Road, where there were two or three cinder block structures. I knew them well. A few years back, I happened upon that place, and a black truck rushed down to greet me with guns drawn. She said the same thing happened to her, but she was in one of the structures, so she grabbed some things, and she and her husband ran. I went over these pages, and felt very uneasy reading them, like this was stuff that people get killed over if it got out. Stupidly, I said, why don't you just simply give them back? She said that they had been running, and everywhere they stop, a black car or van with government or no plates showed up with darkened windows and would just sit there watching them. Well, I really didn't want to get too involved, especially after reading what I did think was way too big for a little old me. I will take what I saw to my death. So I packed them lunch and told them that they could sleep in the treehouse for the night. They did, but they were gone early the next morning before I woke up. After that, we started seeing black vans parked on our lonely road, facing the house. At one point, I even walked up to them, but they took off as soon as I knocked on their blacked-out driver's door window. Lots of unexplained things happened out there in the desert that you don't see much of now. I think because there are more lights and people, well-lit towns, and camera phones pointing everywhere. There weren't cell phones to call for help back then. I remember one time a few years later, it was a fun day with some of my friends. We were in this stupid little red car, called a Yugo, that seemed to be on its last leg most of the time. My friend's uncle told him that there was a whole abandoned town far west of the Mojave Desert, and that there were things just left there all over the place. We were so dumb. It took us a long time to get out there, and if you asked me to try and find out how now, I don't know if I could. I wasn't driving. Thinking we were lost a few times, we started seeing things. 
a carnival ticket booth on a trailer, broken tractors and furniture, little shacks here and there, and empty water bottles all over the place. There wasn't a livable house or store or place of business for many, many miles. I wondered how anyone could even survive in a place like this, and then we saw it. It was a long and looked like single-wide mobile home, if you could ever call it home. It was between 60 to 50 feet long, and it was raised with the siding going all the way to the ground. It looked like something from a horror movie. It had several windows down the length of the house. Some of the windows had old frayed curtains still hung up and blowing in the desert breeze. There were open sections of missing siding, exposing the darkness underneath the structure big enough to step or crawl through. There were old, dusty cars with their doors and trunks open, trash and open cans all over, and a small fire pit in the middle of all of this. His girlfriend and I saw people that seemed to not be wearing any clothes that we could make out, but their bodies were skinny and didn't move like ours. They were inside that house and were watching us from the windows and from the open spaces underneath. They were following us, and as we slowly drove past, they went from window to window and open space to open space underneath. They were almost inhuman and had big eyes and pale skin, too pale for the desert. My friend the driver pulled up next to the fire pit, and despite us screaming to go, 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 he turned off the car. His girlfriend began to cry out that we had to leave then and now. He didn't see what we saw. He said, stop, babe, this stuff is so cool. Oh my god, I wanted to punch him in the face. We both kept looking at the people watching us while begging him to get back in the car and drive. He picked up a long bone off the ground and started to push the soot around the fire pit and said, hey, it looks like somebody cooked a dog. Just then he looked up. His girlfriend leaned over to the driver's seat and grabbed his jacket in an attempt to pull him back into the car when he finally saw what we were seeing and said, Oh shit. That thing hiding under the house was swaying back and forth. His hands were on both sides of the opening, and he was staring at us almost with the intent to lunge. He tried to start the car, but it failed. Thinking that this was my end, that I was about to be eaten in the desert, I began to beat on the back of his seat, screaming, please God, start. After three tries, it finally did. We tore out of there, leaving a huge cloud of dust. We pulled over far from that location and tried to compose ourselves. Never again. We didn't talk about what we saw after that. I think that we were in disbelief that it had even happened. There were so many crazy things that occurred in the desert back in those days. Too many to even come close to tell you. I know that there are things that we do not, or maybe will never, understand. I also know that there are more eyes now paying attention, so I don't think it will be too much longer before we all know the truth. I do believe in the paranormal. Not routinely and not as an explanation for everything, but I definitely believe that some things just can't be logically explained. I've dabbled in divination for the past couple years, which has led me to notice more universal symbolism and omens. Recently, I've seen some weird ones. I was driving around my area the other day, and passed a funeral procession twice. It struck me as sort of unsettling and out of the ordinary. I drive around a lot, and I don't usually see funeral processions around just randomly. I was a little bit anxious by it, especially so when I passed the hearse itself, but I pretty much brushed it off. That same day, I was pulling into a drive through at around 3 a.m., and a black cat came out of seemingly nowhere. It strolled in front of the car and continued walking into nothing. It felt very rare to see, since I live in a well-populated suburb that doesn't usually have animals roaming about. 
This morning, there was a black cat watching my window on the windowsill of the house across from mine. As I looked at the cat, it began to thunderstorm. I know it all sounds really small and maybe a touch overzealous, but I couldn't help but feeling odd about these things because of how out of the ordinary that they felt, and silently spooky. Not to mention, all happening in the same couple of days. The closeness of it all made me curious, and I had to look into it, just to see if these things were things that other people believed to be bad omens. In my very unofficial research, I have found that, one, passing a funeral can be bad luck and can, quote-unquote, hasten your own death. Two, in European folklore, a black cat crossing your path can be unlucky and lead to misfortune and death. Occasionally, however, they can represent good luck, but from what I've found, it's fairly situational. And three, in Greek mythology, thunder could represent punishment to the humans by the gods, associated with Zeus. Clearly, death is kind of a theme here. All of this just doesn't sit well with me, and it's accompanied by a generally strange feeling that I've noticed prevailing in my mood lately. Something just feels off, you know? I was around seven years old when this encounter happened. I was visiting my aunt and uncle's old house for dinner and a movie at their place. They reside in this town about one hour west of the city that I live in. It was around 10 p.m. and the sun had set. Darkness permeated the outdoors. I remember laying down on the couch watching a film, but I was half asleep. Before I intended on sleeping, I felt the urge to go urinate, so I made my way to the hallway leading to the bathroom. This is when things started to get weird. The hallway in the house has two doors on the left-hand side, and two doors on the right-hand side, followed by the bathroom door, which is straight ahead. The first door on the left was for storage, the second being my aunt and uncle's bedroom. The first door on the right led to the basement, and the second to the guest room. Before I made my way to the bathroom, I had the urge to look inside my aunt and uncle's bedroom, and I was in complete shock at what I saw. There was the silhouette of a slender figure dressed in what appeared to be an all-black dress suit, although it could have been anything, as this figure was darker than the darkness surrounding it. The thing was nearly seven feet tall, but was not wearing a hat, and I couldn't make out any facial features. There was no way it could have been my family members, as they were all in the living room still watching the movie. As I was standing there in silence, the figure barely budged, and I just went on to do my business. As I left the bathroom, I looked back to see if this figure was there, and sure enough, it was gone. I bolted down the hallway and plowed my face into the pillows in fear. When my family asked why I ran into the couch like that, I mentioned that it was because I saw a ghost or something. They didn't think much of it at the time thinking the kids, you know, just have their imaginations. But I know what I saw. If you lived in Canada, then you know that there's a lot of countryside out here, along with forests. Most of the abandoned buildings you might come across are found there. I was 16 when this happened. I grew up mostly in the rougher part of the capital. Yes, even Ottawa has its tough spots, and one is known as Vanier. While it's no Detroit, it's still where most of the poor, along with other drug addicts and homeless, live and stay. I've been through plenty of stuff that a lot of people would say is scary, but this is something that still to this day, at 21 years of age, does not sit well with me. I was with my buddies at a warehouse of sorts. It was pretty deep in the forest. We were drinking and talking when one of my friends brought up the old story of a haunted farm near that spot. 
He went on about how the guy who got him in brought him there to scare the crap out of him. I want to add that when they went, he did confirm that his friend was the one who was messing with him, but he still said that something was off about it, so we started making jokes. And then I made a joke that got him really serious. I think I said something along the lines of, there's a ghost in there with Betty White making a porno. He then looks me in the eyes and tells me, no, something is messed up in there. I don't care what, but I felt it. Me being the jerk that I am, I joked about how he was being the worst and that the only thing you really have to fear is fear itself. He then convinced me to go to this haunted barn. In retrospect, I should have just shut up right there and then. Next thing I know, we're heading to the barn. We get there and it's me, my friend, plus this guy that I don't really know but he was with the group. We walk in, the three of us. Me and the other guy start loudmouthing, right? Wild stuff like, hey Casper, what's poppin'? And first spirit that comes out gets bopped on sight. I'm not joking when I say that we get halfway in when these heavy doors shut on us. Those big barn doors, the old ones that took some effort getting them open in the first place, let alone having them swing closed like that. We go to push them open only to find out that they were stuck. So we immediately turn to my friend and start grilling him over trying to trip us up over some fake ghost crap, while Random that was with me starts turning on his flashlight on his phone. I'm asking where our mutual friend is, who I thought was helping him, until I noticed my friend is straight tearing up, which causes me to start freaking out. And I mean freaking out. I'm banging on the door, trying to get homeboy to help, while big homie is acting like a statue. I get a weird feeling on my shoulder. I start to freeze up, and all I hear to my side is, scared, as if it were some kind of taunt. I spin around, seeing the same scene as from when I had started freaking. The guy pushing on the door, my friend staring off into nothing. As I'm asking if anyone heard that, the guy pushing the door starts spazzing, saying something in Spanish, I think. I grab him, telling him to calm down, while he's giving me this look like he just got shot. I'm sitting there trying to snap him out of his funk. Then my friend starts ramming into the door over and over really hard. I thought he was going to hurt himself. It was dark. I can't tell exactly what was being thrown around, but I can tell you that a lot was going through the air. We just started hearing crashes from all sides. I even got hit with something. I still have a scar to this day on the left side of my chin and my left shoulder. Then, the screaming. It was like three chicks were getting cut up. It was awful. I won't lie, I'm not going to act tougher than I am. I started passing out for the first time, being the most bizarre feeling. My friend grabs me and the random guy both of us not seeing that he did get the door open. When we got out, I threw up, while the random dude said something that I didn't catch and then just took off. My friend and I looked at each other and started walking back. The entire way he was explaining that he had no part in this, he kept swearing it up and down. I kept ranting about how that this was impossible and that there was no lock on the door, so how was it even locked? And that caused him to freak out more. I had to go to the doctor to get stitches for whatever it was that flew into me while we were in there. When I told the doctors what happened, which I had to say what happened, but really I should have just made something up because it could have been anything. And when I told them what did happen, they looked at me as if I were crazy upon my explanation. They actually made me go and see a shrink for a bit due to my outlandish claims. After a while, they let me off the hook, thinking that I wasn't crazy. All I know is that I was sober that night. Last time I checked, two beers don't make you trip out. And random dude is refusing to tell us why he was screaming. Now, for a bit of comparison, when I was 15, I had a shotgun pointed at me and then pressed into my stomach, being threatened that they would pull the trigger. But that's simple. I'm about to get blown up, and that's gun plus angry dude equals body. But that night, I could not explain, nor could I control, or fight back. 
That night fills me with a terror that has changed my life. And I see how rooms and dark places that I didn't know what was happening or how to react to or defend are the reasons to this day that this was one of the most horrifying experiences I have ever had. Don't get me wrong. Getting a gun pointed at me got me on the path where I'm trying to change my life. But I can't change not being able to walk in the dark around my house and my refusal to be in dark rooms. This is a true story. When I was in high school, I had a friend who lived near our house. We would always walk from school to our homes. We were pretty close, and we talked about anything. One time, when we were walking along the road, she suddenly spoke and said that she smelled candles. It was a busy street, and it was only around 4 p.m., I think. I replied, it must be from the truck. I said this because one had just driven past us when she said that. She had a serious face, which was unusual because she was more talkative between the two of us. She insisted that she could still smell it as we continued walking, but stopped after a while. Fast forward to the next day. It was Saturday and I had just woken up. I literally got goosebumps. I felt so shocked when I read her text. It said that her father had died. Do you also believe in superstitions? Here in our country, a smell of flower or candle indicates the death of a person. In Europe, medieval churches can have grims. Grims are the spirits of animals that were buried inside them to be their guardians forever. I'm an occultist, as in studies the secret properties of things, not will sacrifice your goat to Satan, and a paranormal investigator, and thought that it would be good to pack a grim on a trip to a local church that seems to have attracted some weird entities. So I said a prayer asking for any grims of redundant churches with nothing better to do to pop in when we got there. As my team and I walked through the field ahead of this church, I said the prayer again, and there was a gust of wind contrary to the direction that the wind had been blowing in the whole time thus far. It was also much stronger than the pre-existing breeze. It moved the tops of the nearby trees with an audible whomp sound and tore away a few loose branches. The gust didn't come from anywhere. It just appeared suddenly where we were. I don't think it traveled far, though frankly I was more impressed with the entrance than watching it. The Grim could no longer be heard after a few minutes of trampling the grass, but I assume it was a good thing. The story I'm about to tell you takes place including myself, my mother, and my younger sister. We were in St. Francisville, Louisiana, staying at the infamous Myrtle's Plantation. I'm aware that when it comes to touristy haunted places, the paranormal events that may occur there are questionable regarding the issue of their validity. As such, I tend to err on the side of caution with my own beliefs and I always do a thorough check of wherever I'm staying. I keep a lookout for artificial motors, wires, basically anything that can cause things to happen that may seem paranormal. The cabin that we stayed in was clear. We arrived at the plantation around 2 p.m. that first day. We were given a complimentary tour of the grounds. I was getting vibes all over the place. It was pretty insane from the moment that I stepped foot on that soil, to be honest. I state the bit about getting vibes with emphasis on the fact that I do get vibes. Sometimes. Rarely. 
and never that strong. After the tour was finished, we were shown to our rooms, we were let in, and left to our own devices. I did my evaluation on the room, then afterward noticed that any time I neared the back door, I picked up on energy even more strongly than I had been during the tour of the rest of the grounds. I just felt that something had happened there, and I knew that I had to find out what. It was about 5 p.m. by that point, and understandably, we were getting pretty hungry. We left the plantation to go into town and get some dinner. We got back around 6.30, and were walking back over to our cabin when a friendly woman that we'd seen earlier walked over to us. She asked if we wanted to see her room. It was located in the actual plantation house, whereas we were staying in what would have originally been one of the slave cabins. We said yes, of course, so she took us up there. We looked around and at first there was nothing noticeable as far as feelings or energy goes. Then I went into the bathroom. It was the most awful, oppressive atmosphere in there. It was creepy and terrible and I hated it instantly. I just wanted to leave. I didn't necessarily think that something had happened there, rather that something inhabited that space. And I knew that it was not something kind. We didn't stay very long. Maybe 15, 20 minutes later, we went back to our cabin and settled in for the night. Lots of vibes in that cabin. And my sister and I, we were somewhat younger at the time, shared a bed because we were scared. We stayed up late playing a game. When midnight rolled around, we decided that it was probably best to put it away and go to bed. As soon as we had put the game up and silence set in, however, I noticed a sound. The rocking chair on the front porch was creaking as it moved. Backward, forward, backward, forward. Hard enough that I could be certain that the wind was not responsible. I freaked out a little bit, but decided that I wasn't going to mention it to my sister. It would probably just scare her. We laid down for the night. She got to sleep quick. I, on the other hand, was having sleep issues. Nothing but thoughts and worries running through my mind. The moment I heard footsteps on the stones outside of our cabin, though, all of those pesky voices became irrelevant. Keep in mind, our cabin was fenced in, so it couldn't have been anyone who didn't have the key. Regardless, I heard the footsteps, and they continued as I heard the light slapping sounds of feet on the wooden porch along with the groan of someone's weight. They continued forward, right through the door, and I heard as whoever it was passed right by my bed. The whole time, I saw nothing. The footstep sounds made their way across the room to the wall, then out the back door. I will say that while I saw nothing, I did smell something. It was as though someone were wearing rosehip perfume, trailing the scent along behind them everywhere they walked. This event took place at about one in the morning. Already having trouble getting to sleep, I didn't rest until two and a half hours later, approximately 3.30 a.m., when we got up the next day, we went into the main house for breakfast, where we heard stories from other campers about their experiences. Theirs were equally intriguing, including people who felt a presence sit down on their bed in the middle of the night, and a person coming out of a cabin to tell people to be quiet. Yet the cabin in question was totally devoid of anyone alive. We ate, shared our stories, and returned to our cabin. We sat there for a while playing games on our tablets, just relaxing, really, as it was a nice room despite its history and the fact that it was haunted. I can't remember why, but my sister and mom got into an argument. The disagreement obviously didn't sit well with whatever spirits were occupying the cabin, because they were both interrupted by the faucet in the bathroom being turned on full force and then back off again. It startled all three of us. We cleared out of the cabin in less than 30 seconds after that. 
That is the end to my Myrtle's plantation story. I am never going to forget how terrifying that it was to be awake by myself in a cabin in the middle of nowhere and suddenly realize that you are not alone. This story comes from my girlfriend, who told me that a couple of months ago her mom was exiting an office that she works at in the middle of the night when she saw an apparition. She described it as looking like a very abnormally large black dog that was staring her down in the parking lot. Apparently the dog charged at her and vanished as it went through her, never to be seen again after that. Now, my girlfriend's mom is no stranger to the paranormal and has tons of crazy stories, and this being the latest incident, she knew it meant something bad. She called my girlfriend frantically, asking her to check on her grandpa, who they were taking care of for about a year at that point, but he was okay. Two days later, however, he passed on. This also happened to my girlfriend's grandma on her mom's side, where she was outside and saw a large, black dog on the roof of her house staring her down until it jumped down and vanished into her as well. Her first husband died after she received this visit from the dog. From what I could take from the story, it seemed more immediate than just two days. It was the first I've ever heard of a large black dog figure appearing, and a few hours later, my curiosity led me to searching for similar experiences online. I stumbled across mythology and folklore, speaking of how large black dogs and or hellhounds are omens of death. I hold this Celtic belief, which is that on Halloween night, the veil between our world and the world of the dead is thinner. So I'm pretty spooked on Halloween. This Halloween was pretty messed up for me. Nothing had ever happened on any Halloween before this one. The house I live in right now is not haunted. Everyone feels great in it. So on Halloween night, I took a nap. Weird sleep schedule. The doorbell kept ringing because kids wanted candles and treats. I wasn't alone, so other people were answering. Between two of those waking up for a couple seconds before going back to sleep moments, I had the weirdest experience. I hadn't turned the light off, so I saw it very clearly. It was so bizarre. I saw two little girls entering my room and just running around before disappearing. There are no kids in that house, but I was like, it's just me. Then something else happened at night when I was trying to sleep. I woke up and saw someone next to my bed facing me, entirely encompassed by shadow. I thought at first, oh, it's my boyfriend, but my boyfriend left two days before to work. He was pretty far away. So I started to realize that it wasn't him, and I just tried to turn on the light while I was panicking. No one. That happened just before this experience. I saw a shadow walking into my room and I thought it was my boyfriend again, except it wasn't because he was again not here. It wasn't sleep paralysis. I could move and everything. I experienced it before and it's definitely not that. A few years ago, my best friend Jay and I decided to start exploring in the desert near a tiny statutory town close to our hometown with an immense expanse of land and an adjoining wild horse preserve. We were hooked immediately, both of us people who enjoy hiking and camping. This place seemed like heaven. 
It wasn't long before we found an amazing little campsite about 15 miles or so into the desert, far away from any light pollution and even cell phone signal. It's the perfect place with a small reservoir used in the late summer to water free-range cattle, an old corral, and a fire pit carved into the sandstone. We decided we needed to go camping as soon as possible and planned on having our first camping trip a few days later on my days off. Jay and his S.O. met me out there with our dogs, and the first day was a ton of fun playing around the book cliffs high above the Grand Junction and sighting wild horses. We returned to camp late in the afternoon and had a nice time cooking dinner and telling stories around the campfire. Soon darkness fell, and I began to become aware that I had been feeling uneasy. Not wanting to ruin the fun for my friends, I told them I was tired and needed to turn in. I returned to my tent with my two dogs and snuggled in, the feeling of unease tightening around my shoulders. I couldn't shake the feeling of anxiety, so I did what I do best and chose to ignore it, turning on a movie that I'd downloaded on my laptop. As the intro played to my movie, I caught movement out of the corner of my eye. I paused the film and stared behind me. I saw what looked like the bobbing of a flashlight behind our camp near the dirt road. The light danced for a few minutes before disappearing. I looked beside me and saw that my dogs were still sleeping peacefully and chalked it up to my imagination before returning to my movie. I must have fallen asleep because it wasn't long before Jay's S.O. was waking me up and asking me to come help calm Jay down. When I left my tent, my friend was visibly upset and shaken. He kept apologizing and asking if we could leave. He said he didn't know what was wrong, but that he needed to leave, that we needed to leave now. I told him that I'd been feeling incredibly uneasy and watched all night, and we agreed to go. Taking only our dogs and pillows, we left our campsite and drove the long 30 miles back home in the middle of the night. The drive back into the town was nerve-wracking. I had to keep glancing in the rearview mirror to make sure that my friend's car was still behind me. It took everything I had to keep my vehicle under 20 miles an hour so that I wouldn't ruin my car on the heavily rutted dirt roads, but it felt as though we were being chased away. The next day, Jay decided to go back for our things. Both his S.O. and I had to work that day, so he drove out to the campsite in the early afternoon. Everything was as it should be. No animals had touched our stuff or even tried to get into the cooler but he said that he still felt watched and as if something wasn't right. A few weeks later, a friend of Jay's was in town visiting and wanted to go camping, so Jay took him back to the spot near the reservoir. He said he experienced the same feeling laying there in his tent, his whole body screaming out in anxiety. He said all of his muscles were tense, and he had the overwhelming feeling that if he were to close his eyes, that something horrible would happen. So he left his tent, not wanting to wake his friend, and decided to take a stroll around the campsite. Before long, he found himself down by the reservoir. This is when he saw a small but brightly intense light darting and dancing back and forth, tucked into the valley below the Grand Mesa, going from east to west. It darted and whirled around. He said the feeling of fear and unease was so intense that he went back to his tent without watching to see if the light went away. We have both had a handful of odd experiences out there following these incidents. I've taken several friends and family members out there to experience the beauty. One summer I was seeing a guy who was interested in checking out the area, so I took him to a spot where we could park my car and explore near the Twin Peaks. We started walking up an oil field admin road when I was overcome with the urge to climb up the sandstone rock fall at the base of the mountain. My friend followed me, and we hiked up until he found an opening to a cave. We peered in and found that the opening was more like a skylight. The bottom was a good 20 feet or so below us. We decided to look around and see if there was an actual entrance. After a bit of searching, we followed my dog to the entrance of the cave. It was low and slightly blocked off by fallen sandstone, so we had to get on our backs and inch in foot first. When we got in, we saw that we were only in a smaller antechamber, but the smell of something decaying and the feeling of unease we felt told us to leave, so we did. 
It was only after we got back into the car that I discovered I dropped my favorite vape. It's been two years since I lost it, but every time I'm around there, I have the overwhelming urge to return. On one occasion, my mom and I took our dogs out to the desert to run free. I took her to a cool rock outcropping that I call Castle Rock. We hiked up the rock structure and started to make our way around it when we noticed the base of this rock structure was littered with small bones of every variety. This creeped my mom out heavily, but I am sort of a goblin by nature, so I started picking through them for things to take home. My mom told me she didn't feel right and wanted to walk back down to the jeep. I told her to please hold on a minute that I'd been wanting to check this place out, so she stayed while I hiked up the right side of the structure. I found some cool rocks, took some pictures, and enjoyed the view from the top of the rocks before heading down. When I got back to my mom, she was extremely upset, saying that she had been yelling for me the whole time and that she couldn't find me anywhere. I laughed her off and told her that I was thirsty, so we returned to her jeep. As soon as we got in, we noticed a volleyball in front of her vehicle. It was maybe three feet in front of her jeep right where we had walked past, with no footprints or any indication as to how it had gotten there. There have been several other strange occurrences, but nothing ever really seems to happen. Only eerie feelings, occasional lights, and the sensation that someone is watching you. But I always manage to convince myself that there really isn't anything going on, besides an overactive imagination, and I always return. I'm incredibly drawn to the area, like nothing I've ever experienced before. I've even taken a couple of solo camping trips, despite being a single female by myself. But I always return, even after promising my best friend and my sister that I wouldn't go out there alone anymore. I always do. Jay refuses to go camping out there anymore, and it takes a great deal of effort to convince him to go explore anymore. Despite the fact that he has hitchhiked from Michigan to Colorado, done solo backpacking and more, he can't stand it. Beside the feeling of being watched when I'm out there, the fixation bordering on obsession with this place kind of makes me nervous. I always feel like I'm searching for something when I'm out there, leading me to go to new places and check out new areas. My first visit to this hospital was in 2018. After searching for the address for a while, I came across one that looked accurate enough and went on my way to that lost place with a friend of mine. We arrived, astonished by the size of the complex. I didn't do a lot of research before that. I just knew that it used to be a hospital and was built during World War II. And by the address, it seemed legit. On our way down from the parking lot to the lost place, our excitement was growing, but so was our anxiety for reasons that we just couldn't ascertain. We make our way onto the complex at the part where the main entrance was before, and the air felt really dense. My friend felt the same way, but we brushed it off as just being a bit nervous, just ourselves, and we started to walk past some buildings at the entrance, completely focused and being amazed. At some point, my pulse must have slowed down due to me being focused on trying to take in everything I was seeing, because I noticed that it increased in speed when we reached the buildings where I suspected that the patients would have been. It felt like there was strong electricity in the air that made me feel even more uneasy. That's when we heard a door slam behind us at one of the buildings. We, of course, completely froze. The sound came from a building that was pretty far away from us, and that sound was very loud. There was no wind at all that could have caused the heavy doors to slam like that. The trees weren't moving, nor did we hear anything else. Just one door that decided to slam shut on its own. We nervously chuckled and decided to move closer to the exit. I asked my friend if I should record this visit on my phone, and she agreed. We both turned on airplane mode and went on our way. Whether it was due to our anxiety 
or us being too alert, or something actually being there. We would turn around or stop walking at the same time, asking the other if we had heard that sound. Sometimes the sounds behind us resembled soft footsteps. Other times we would hear silent whispers that we couldn't quite make out. At some point I began to question my sanity, but I knew that there had to be something there to make such specific noises, loud enough that my friend would also hear them, as I did. As we were walking toward the actual exit, we stopped to look at one building and we heard a very, very loud bang behind us, making our walking become very determined as we made our way to the main street. The bang was accompanied by other sounds that we couldn't define back then. Fast forward and both of us are at my place. We grab individual headphones and start to listen to the recording. And boy, was that some weird stuff. We both enabled playing mode before I hit the record button, but there were so many disturbances in the recording, distinct sounds like someone coughing, whispers, with clear vowels, that we couldn't quite make out the full words to. A woman's voice going, shh, breathing, and bleeps. I have to admit that we were freaking out a lot. I was almost crying because I found it to be so chilling. The thing that baffled us the most was the loud bang that made us leave. I swear to you, it wasn't there. At all. Not the bang on the recording that startled us so much that made us leave the place, but silent sounds? You can hear us being startled and agreeing to leave immediately, but no bang could be heard on that recording, and it's still not there. I held my phone the exact same way that I had been since I started that recording. I didn't put my clothes against one mic, the mics weren't broken after a test recording that we did. So there should be a banging sound, but absolutely there is not, and I have no clue why that is the case. That hospital is a really special place. From later experiences there, I have come to possible conclusions as to what kind of paranormal things occur. This is a story my grandma and grandpa told me a while back. I'm originally from a small town in Pennsylvania, and my grandfather was a state trooper for a majority of the time that he lived there before retirement. He took a course on hazardous waste removal. I can't remember his reasoning, but he was trained to be a guy in a hazmat suit who took toxic or irradiated waste away from certain locations. One night, while he and my nana were asleep, he violently jolted straight up to a sitting position in his bed, still asleep. He pointed to a chair in the corner of his room and said to my grams, who had been awoken by his movement, Mary Lou, he's sitting right there in the chair. Do you see him? My nana was freaked out, so she tried to get him to lay back down in the bed, which took a few minutes, but eventually he was back to sleeping soundly. In the morning, my pop said that he saw death sitting in the chair in his room staring at him, and he took that as an omen that he was going to die very soon. About two months later, an incident at Three Mile Island occurred, and the police force out there asked my pop's station to send all of his people there who had hazardous waste training to help get it cleaned up. My pop decided to take two weeks off and take a trip to Mexico with my mom and uncle because of the dream that he had had. And when he got back, many of the people that he had known at his office had some kind of radiation poisoning that eventually killed them. I don't tell it as well as they do, but I thought it was an interesting story. When I was 16, I started dating this 20-year-old. It was a very bad relationship in which I was cheated on and treated like crap, but that's another story. Anyway, after my 17th birthday, I finally dumped him and got him to leave me alone. 
A couple months later, I was on Skype with one of my old friends around 1 a.m. All of a sudden, I hear tap, tap, tap on my window. Now, my bed is right next to, kind of, underneath my window. And my bedroom is on the other side of the house from my parents. I asked my friend if he had heard anything, and he said no. A few seconds later, tap, 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 and he said yeah, that he had heard that. I agreed, ended the Skype call, and ran to my parents' room. I woke my mom up, and after telling her why I woke her up, she stopped being angry, and we tried to see if anyone was outside the house. No dice. So I slept in my parents' bed with them. At seventeen. The next day, my dad had apparently seen vague shoe prints outside my window. It happened twice more, and after the third time, my mom called the non-emergency police line and was suggested to put up a motion light and or a security camera. We put up a motion light that day. I've yet to hear knocking on my window since the light was put up, and it's been two and a half years. I'm about 95% certain that it's my psycho ex, because he would come to my window between 1 and 3 a.m. when we were together, sometimes, and knock. Also, one of my friends who had mutual friends with my ex said that my ex was in the area. He lived about 30 miles away from me, the nights when the knocking happened. So, for my cheating asshole of an ex, let's not meet again. This probably isn't the scariest of stories, but it still worries me how badly things could have gone. It was the end of a long night, nearly 10 p.m., and all my friends had just caught the last train home. 13-year-old me was standing in Hamilton Central train station waiting on my mom to come and pick me up. The bus bay was near enough deserted, and there were very few people milling about. I wasn't particularly concerned about being alone at night. I did this every week after hanging out with my friends. I had been standing there for about 15 minutes when an older, mid-30s, seemingly drunk man approached me asking for 50 pence for a bus. I told him I didn't have any money, and he wandered off to ask the other people around at the shop. He returned a few minutes later and stood beside me, occasionally looking me up and down. Despite my age, I was around 6 feet, and always looked about 16 or 17, and was pretty used to guys in their 20s hitting on me, but this guy was different. He wasn't saying anything. He was just leering at me, and alarm bells were going off left, right, and center in my brain. Just as I opened my mouth to ask him if he needed anything, he started babbling away, asking about how long it would take to walk to Glasgow, as he needed to get there before 10, or the police would put him back in jail. Instinctively, I asked him what he had been in jail for, and he gave me the biggest grin, and starts telling me about how he had quote-unquote found someone fingering his bird, and so he messed him up. Long story short, he caught his girlfriend cheating on him, and killed the guy. He continues like this for a few minutes, then starts moving closer to where I'm standing. I was nearly blacking out with fear, as I was completely defenseless if he were to decide to stab me or take me. Luckily, just as he got within my personal bubble, my mom pulled up and I bolted to the car and made her drive home as fast as she could. In August of 2013, I visited the small town of Clowderville, Louisiana to investigate the cellar of a tiny, abandoned farmhouse. I was drawn to this place because in 1932, a woman was murdered here, and in 1933, her husband mysteriously vanished. While this situation alone was not of particular interest to me, the story surrounding it captured my attention. The following is the history behind the haunted candle of Clowderville as I have come to understand it. In 1932, the farmhouse was owned by Adam and Emily Benoit. Adam was a farmer, 
a hard man, and not a particularly likable one. Although he did run a successful farm, he was also an alcoholic and spent most nights at the local pub. His wife Emily was a quiet woman who had no social ties and instead spent all of her time at home alone. In June of 1932, Emily was found murdered in the cellar. Police records state that she had been struck from behind with a blunt object. They were able to determine that she did not die immediately. She had crawled from the place of impact to the back of the cellar. In her outstretched hand was a candle holder. It would have been the only source of light. Adam Benoit was naturally listed as the primary suspect, but he had an alibi. He was with his friend that night at the pub. The friend was a local drunkard with a less than stellar reputation, but nevertheless, Adam's alibi was accepted. The murder of Emily Benoit to this day remains unsolved. Early in February of 1933, Adam Benoit was reported missing. He had not been seen at the pub for several days, which was very out of the ordinary for the recent widower. Police investigation led to the cellar in which Emily had met her demise. The lead officer wrote that he had heard a man sobbing, but he found the cellar to be empty. The only sign that anyone had been there was a single candle burning against the back wall. The officer also wrote that upon extinguishing the candle, the sobbing faded. It's also in the record that the police officer found the word alone carved into the wall. The whereabouts of Adam Benoit also went unsolved. He was never seen again. The following year in 1934, the farmhouse was purchased by a man named John Morell. When he was not seen or heard from in several weeks, police officers once again were led to the cellar to investigate. They found the exact same candle flickering dimly from the shadows. The officers once again reported hearing a man sobbing and noted having seen the outline of a female form in the weak light. When the candle was extinguished, the voices stopped and the woman's shadow disappeared. Once again written on the wall was the word alone, only written out three times rather than just the one. Like Adam Benoit, John Morell was never seen or heard from again. The farmhouse to this day, still in his name, fell into disrepair. When I visited the farmhouse in 2013, I had every intention of exploring the cellar. The building had long been abandoned, so I broke the lock and cautiously ventured inside. I found everything to be completely untouched. Dusty wine bottles still filled the shelves. Old, rusty tools were piled in a corner. At the back of the cellar, I found a candle covered in dust and burned almost to the end. All over the walls of the cellar, across the ceiling, across every inch of surface, was the word alone. As I had expected, the word was written in two distinct styles, and I had come prepared. I compared the writing to that of Adam Benoit's journal, as well as John Morrell's signature on the deed. I'm no expert, but the two styles appeared to me as identically matching the samples that I had brought with me. There's no way that this wasn't the writing of the two long-banished men. In my curiosity, I lit the candle. Softly at first, then growing louder and louder, I heard the sobbing, the sounds of loss, of despair, the weeping of those abandoned to an eternity of nothingness. And in the shadows, the figure of a woman slowly drifted into view, dancing toward me. I quickly extinguished the flame and left the cellar. But of course, I brought the candle with me. The haunted candle of Clowderville has sat quietly in my collection for several years now. 
Only once since that day have I lit the flame. I was in my attic among my collection, and almost immediately I heard the quiet sobbing of poor souls lost in time. I snuffed out the flame. The next day, carved into a rafter in my attic, I discovered a single word. You guessed it. It said, alone. I used to go to this one church that wasn't too far away from my house. I had gone there for years before noticing anything. One day I was at the church with a friend. It was just her, her husband, and I. There was no one else in the entire building. We were in the gym, and I heard what sounded like a cabinet door slam in another room. I got up to check and see if anyone else had come in without us noticing, but everything was quiet and empty. I was confused and tried convincing myself that maybe the pastor was playing a joke on us or something like that, though I had no idea why he wouldn't reveal himself if it was him. I walked all the way through the church, never running into anyone else. The next week it was the same scenario. Just the three of us, alone in the church yet again. I was up in the sanctuary, not doing anything important but just playing around on my phone. I looked over toward the front where the podium was and noticed what looked like a shadow walking across the room. I'm not sure if these things are easily explained away or if these were actually paranormal experiences. What do you all think it could be? So I found this old, abandoned, broken-down house in the woods close to where I live. I've only lived here about a year. I was alone walking around it, trying to see if I could have a peek inside. While I was walking around and whatnot, I felt a bit scared, but I pressed on. I found a way in, but it smelled so much of mold that I just decided not to bother. Anyway, the point of the story... When I was about to leave, I felt this sensation of sadness wash over me. I stopped and turned around and looked at an open window of the house from about 10 meters away. And I swear that there was a woman who stood there being in pain from the state of her house. I stared and was almost about to cry for a few moments as I walked away. But then I stopped and looked back again. I almost felt drawn to the house, not wanting to leave. But as soon as I got away from it and was walking back home through the forest, the feeling of sadness left. On a side note, the day before I had walked through a part of the forest where a lot of trees had been cut down and a lot of branches and bark were scattered all over the ground. There I also felt such sadness, as if the trees themselves were crying. As I'm writing this, I realize that I sound kind of insane, but I have never really felt this way before, and I feel normal like one day later, like today. Around 2013, my senior year of high school, my mom, brother, and two friends planned a Halloween ghost hunt type deal. We headed out to this park that was notoriously haunted. We even made sure to go at 3 a.m. to get maximum results. One friend brought her camera and got tons of orbs. Not the most solid evidence, but pretty cool regardless. My brother decides to sit on the end of the pier on the lake and do some recordings. He ends up getting the clearest, creepiest EVP I've ever heard in my life. About two minutes in, he asks a question. It goes quiet and you can clearly hear a man's voice yelling out, Don't shoot. Followed by a few seconds of silence and then an agonized groan. None of us heard this until we played it back in the car. I remember shivers running down my spine and I started crying because I was so scared of it. 
I still have the recording, but I only ever show it to people that I trust. That wasn't the only strange thing that happened that night, but it was by far the one that sticks with us all the most. My brother has only listened to it that one time in the car afterward. He refuses to listen to it again. It's been six years. My wife is a travel nurse, and we've been living here in Gallup, New Mexico for about three months now. We actually only have a week left here, and I'm glad. From the first day we arrived, we felt like something was off. We thought maybe it was just being in a new place, though we haven't felt that way in our previous locations, and maybe because the desert is so radically different from what we're used to. Just a little bit about Gallup. The demographic here is a majority Navajo with some Zuni and Hopi people as well. Gallup is landlocked by these three reservations, and the nearest city is Albuquerque, which is about two hours away. Now, despite what I just mentioned, being a non-native here in Gallup is not a big deal at all. There's no radical tension issues that we've experienced during our stay. In fact, we've really liked the people we've met here. Yet there is a burning feeling inside of me, like I shouldn't be here, and that we need to leave. And my wife told me that she feels the same thing. As for psychics and feeling negative energy and all that stuff, I personally think it's probably just a bunch of hooey. That's not what I'm saying here. This is more like an instinct that we need to leave and not renew the contract here. And it is only in Gallup. We stayed in Rue Doso a few years ago and loved it there. We have traveled to many places surrounding Gallup and felt fine, but as soon as we came home from the trips, there was that feeling of something being not right. I used to work in a hotel as a security guard. It was built in 1922 and had a basement. One night, the front desk clerk, the valet, and I are just hanging out in the lobby just chatting when a phone rings. The phone call was coming from the basement where there are offices. At the time, there was supposed to be no one in there. I had already locked the doors and made sure that the basement was empty. The clerk picked up the phone, heard a weird noise, and then got disconnected. It chilled me to the bones. The valet guy and I went down to make sure that it was, in fact, empty and that no one had been trespassing. The doors were still locked, and I didn't see anyone coming out, so we went inside the office. The only thing that we found was the phone blinking, and it looked like someone had picked it up and dropped it. The valet and I looked at each other, and there was cold sweat on our faces. That is one of the creepiest things that has ever happened to me when working as graveyard security. I was wondering if anyone could offer their thoughts or an explanation on a paranormal experience that I had as a child. When I was 11, my younger sister passed away from a very sudden death. Months before this incident, I had a vision in the middle of the night that I had never made sense of until recently. I had woken up and saw a floating orb of white light in my room. Inside of it was a young child, around four, maybe five years old, the same age as my late sister, with short hair wearing a Victorian-style nightgown. I came close to it and stared at it for a minute or two, and then went back to sleep. The next day, I was filled with overwhelming anxiety and the feeling of someone's presence in the house. Only years after this vision and the death of my sister have I thought that this could possibly be some sort of omen or warning of her death.
So basically, me and my friend were messing around until he informed me about a part of the web so messed up and dangerous that it's illegal. I kinda thought he was bluffing, but asked to see anyway. I can't remember how he got there, but somehow he did, because he said he went on there for laughs and gags. When we got on there, everything seemed normal, until he started to see things with titles like military grade lasers or military grade integral silencers. As we got further in, we started seeing more things like drugs and, of course, more illegal weapons. We finally just quickly scrolled through stuff since we didn't really see anything that piqued our interest, until we came across a website or something titled Daycare for Kids. When we clicked on it, we saw what looked to be a room covered in feces and blood with a caged mic in the middle. We got so scared, we closed out of the browsers as fast as possible, and never went back. It's been about eight months since this incident. I still remember it clearly. It was around 10 o'clock in the morning. My mom was in the bathroom taking a bath, so we can say that I was the only person in the house with my dog. I was feeling thirsty, so I went to the kitchen to get a glass of water and my dog followed. When I turned around after drinking the water, I saw a shadow figure. It was completely opaque, pitch dark, and had a full humanoid form. It ran from the gallery in the room that was parallel to me. At that moment, my dog started barking wildly and ran into the same room. I had a pug, and we all know pugs don't usually bark that much, but at that moment, he was barking too much. I froze, wondering what to do, and when I came back to my senses, I sprinted, took my dog, and locked myself into a room. Even after locking ourselves in, my dog was still growling. When my mother came out, we checked the whole house, but we couldn't find anyone. Two months after that incident, my dog died. Me and some friends went to an abandoned mental asylum at night, not really expecting much. We busted in through one of the boarded up windows, and when we were inside, we all heard talking. We figured that other people were there, so we followed the sound. We were walking down the hall and heard a woman whispering, Why did you take my baby? Over and over again. At this point, I was visibly shaking, and we all believed we found where the sound was coming from originally. We go to this room, and there was a huge cage. It looked like one of those pet carriers, only human-sized. I don't know what actually happened that night. I don't really believe that dead people were talking in there, but the sheer creepiness of it all was just too much. I was in Pennsylvania exploring an abandoned mill slash factory that had been built in the 1800s at dusk. I was standing on a pile of limestone cinder blocks surrounded by tall grass and brush with a tree line about an acre away just after the sun had set while my friends were inside still. As I was climbing down, I heard a low guttural growl, not like a dog's growl or any type of animal for that matter. It was deep. It had much more bass to it. It was very disturbing and not like anything I have ever heard before. It sounded as if it were very close, but I didn't hear any brush moving. 